Guten Morgen, meine sehr geehrten Damen und Herren. Guten Morgen, lieber Hubertus. Herzlich willkommen in der friedrich ebert stiftung Ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome here at the friedrich ebert Foundation. I would also like to welcome Michael Vassilidis. Vassiliadis. Unfortunately, he cannot be here now uh, for this presidential meeting. He's with us online. Michael, I cannot see you, unfortunately, but I hope you can see me. So a warm welcome to you as well. Friends, ladies and gentlemen here in this room and to all of you who are tuned in online on behalf of the Friedrich Hebert Foundation, I would like to most warmly welcome you to the conference, The Changing World Supply Chain Laws as, an op as a Chance with the question mark. So I'm happy to see so many of you have come to speak on this topic with us, to exchange a lot of, come with a lot of colleagues, a lot of people from civil society have come here, also a lot of people who represent employees who've come here in presence and who've come in large numbers online. Apologies from the interpreters. There is no sound. There is no sound. We cannot hear the German original. Interpretation will resume shortly. Stelle ausdrücklich begrüßen möchte unser Partner. Vielen Dank an diese Stiftung für die stets gute und vertrauensvolle Zusammenarbeit. Thank you to Liebe Gäste, in den letzten zwei Jahren ist viel passiert nach Sound Cooperation Guests. Many things have happened. Wurde das Lieferketten sorgfalts fast few months. So. There were fierce discussions when it comes to striking verabschiedet results and negotiations when it comes to the Supply Chain Due Diligence Act. It took a while. However, still, the Supply Chain Due Diligence Act was passed. And with that, Germany sends out a strong signal for fair, sustainable and, global and solidary globalization. Germany is so implementing what the UN guiding principles on human rights and on human rights has enshrined for a decade already, not only states, but also multinational com corporations have to respect human rights everywhere around the world. In a few months, on the 1st of January 2023, the German law will come into force. It is a great, great achievement, and allow me to say, as a witness of these times, Mr. A minister Dear Hubertus, I, this is also mainly thanks to you. And it sends out a strong signal. The EU supply chain law is also being discussed on the European level, and it will have an important impact on the European level. So there is talk already on the European level to protect people around the world, people and the environment in global value chains, and it is supposed to have international impact and provide legal certainty for companies and cater for a, playing, a level playing field. But one thing is clear, ladies and gentlemen, looking at the standards in context of exploitation of human capital and planet Earth is usually or can be a unique selling point in international competition. So we need to confront that. And that is why this conference here today is so important to raise awareness, to sensitize and also in order to confront a current development, or rather it's not only about the current development, it's 
really rather an obligation. If we want to fulfill our own standards with regard to our responsibility in this country and abroad and also towards nature as well. So looking at the last two years, one thing is very clear. There's no question global challenges have increased dramatically. There are numerous crises around the world, the climate crisis, of course, the ongoing corona pandemic. It's something that affects us every day. And the same goes for Russian war of aggression on Ukraine. All of this has started at sight and went in a turning point in history. And not only in terms of peace and security, it's also influenced by the pandemic and the climate crisis. And all of these crises, of course, in turn create other crises, disrupted supply chains, su bottlenecks in supply strategies of raw materials and increased commodity prices are just a few, but few consequences and examples of that pose major challenges to employees and companies and products in close contact with supply chains, or rather we can say it is much more present in our minds as it used to be in the past. So reactions to this crisis have to, must be social reactions. They have to focus on social cohesion globally. Human rights cannot be thought along the lines of national borders. Our global partnerships must not only be continued, but also be further strengthened. This includes responsible corporate behavior and practices. So deglobalization, friend shoring, reshoring. And allow me to say that as an experienced international politician, they are no patent solutions. We should rather focus on globalization itself and look at its setup, its design. Globalization must not only be more socially and ecologically sustainable, but also more resilient towards external disturbances. And that is indeed possible. Supply chains can must be, can be an essential building block towards more resilience in global values. With regard to international division of labor, so Germany has already set a strong, sent out a strong signal, taken on the lead with its due diligence act. So now it's Europe's turn. Today's conference, therefore, focus on this question of the question of opportunities, of opportunities that lie in supply chain laws or can lie in supply chain laws and must offer employees and companies better solution, especially in times of these political, uh, multiple crises. I'm glad to, I'm delighted to have to receive the signal from politics, and I'm glad that we have representatives, Mr. Hubertus Heil and Ms. Walters are here, and I think that speaks for itself. <coughs> Mr. Vasiliadis is also on board and I'm glad to have trade unions on board as well. So transformation can only happen if companies, if businesses and trade unions join forces. And this is also illustrated by what we've achieved with the Due Diligence Act. Now it is time to give trade unions a say, more co-determination at the European level. This will facilitate cooperation. If we only leave it at a national level and don't manage to transpose it to a broader scheme, then we cannot be successful. And that is the message we need to take on board to Brussels to make sure that we can also send out a strong signal 
from Brussels, from the EU towards Europe and the world. And Hubertus, I'm sure you have a lot of work ahead. This is difficult, a difficult task, and everything that's what's said on informally is something else that's been said formally into the microphone. I know this well, so alliances are so important in order to provide backup for you and support you. Hence, it's important that we from the Friedrich Ebert Foundation also join forces and accompany the, the implementation of the German law and introduction of EU supply chain law. So we make reports available, publications and such. And to be successful here, of course, we enter into a very close dialogue with our partners around the world. And I think that is what makes the Friedrich Ebert Foundation so unique. We hear from our partners around the world firsthand. They tell us about the environmental impacts, and we are in close touch with them. We had invited Rosa Mamo, of course, uh, from Kenya. Unfortunately, had she had to cancel her visit. She couldn't make it. She wasn't able to participate at this conference. We are still trying to include her perspective. At the same time, we are currently working on a publication to include, to look at the perspective of our partners in the Global South and makes their view a priority. So, ladies and gentlemen, I wish you a fruitful conference and looking around, I'm sure it will be a controversial, but at the same time, stimulating discussion. Thank you so much for being here, Andrea. You have the floor. <coughs> this is nothing new, Martin. Thank you. Martin Hubertus, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, as I said. Martin, I'm delighted that we uh, we can open this conference here today on the question of the Supply Chain Due Diligence Act, looking at what's still to happen on a European level. It is a long title, but still. Of course, this illustrates also how well we cooperate, how good the collaboration is between our foundations. So first of all, a warm thanks to our colleagues from our foundations who made this possible and who will continue with their splendid work, I am sure. So our question is today also, how strong can such an act be? Looking at trade, looking at exchange, looking at whether the law can actually be implemented, or how it can be implemented. So looking at back to February 24th, there's one thing that is very clear. Um, laws can only be successful if they are upheld. And unfortunately, there are some issues with that, as we've seen with the war of aggression, Russians' war of aggression of Ukraine that we've witnessed. International law has been violated, and it has also shattered our certainty that politics that is based on rules can persevere, persevere. and that is the foundation of our international relations, and it is it has been severely shaken, at the least. We need to be sure that international norms that provide the basis of our coexistence, of our living together, and that's also the basis for our economic activity, that these rules and norms are upheld. And that means that laws need to be enforced. But that alone is not enough. 
we need more. We need civil society and their commitment. You touched upon this, Martin, in your opening remarks. And we need civil society to support this. We need constitutional norms. We need trade unions. We need politicians. And we need to enable them to enforce this. And that's why it is all the more important that we speak about this today and that we make sure that this Supply Chain Act becomes is a success story. And we should not forget to look at open questions after this conference. Of course, our work continues. Our foundation will continue to cooperate with the Friedrich Ebert Foundation. We will collaborate. We will prioritize main issues look at open questions, look at the core, look at what we need to do. There's the foundation work and environment that's on board as well. And they will focus on raw materials, look at where they are extracted, produced. And then we'll look at human rights. That's not only because that goes hand in hand with our responsibility, but it also with the supply chain's resilience. So economic and social aspects come together here. And I think it's important to mention this, because if you only focus on one of the issues, you can't really do justice to the complexity of this topic. Now, I think this is such an essential topic. I'm looking forward to the discussions. I'm looking forward to our exchange. And I'm looking forward to opening up new questions that we can answer together. So thanks to all and fruitful discussions to all of us. Yes, thank you very much, dear Martin Schulz uh, and Andrea Arkais for, for these introductory words, uh, but also these very good orientation uh, words for uh, the welcoming us here at the conference. Uh, the changing world, the due diligent laws at the, as the opportunity is the title, and we hope that we can actually um, uh, delete the um, question mark. Franziska Korn is my name. I'm responsible for human rights here at um, Friedrich Ebert uh, Foundation. And with uh, my colleague, um, Carola Dickmann, uh, I will uh, guide you through today's conference. We are very happy uh, for the interest in this conference. So sometimes you forget about this. I mean, uh, when you have the, this, these small rounds, you know that in the virtual uh, space also there are many people also um, interested in the conference and we are very happy about that. This is why also we have the, the opportunity or you have the opportunity to ask questions uh, in the live stream. Uh, there's a chat uh, feature that you can use for that purpose. So welcome um, and uh, please feel free to use this feature. Now let's continue. I would like to... Um, start with a few quotes, and there are many of those. Uh, so, uh, act with teeth. So we are uh, showing that decency and um, well-being are no, no contradictions. So we are sending out a strong signal to Europe. You will know, especially here, who um, said this. Yes, it was our Minister of Labour, Hubertus Heil. Um, who, in an intensive way, in a successful way, um, fought for this due diligence law. It's a little bit of a complicated uh, term in, in German, but we won't go into the, de into the details here. And after a uh, successful uh, fight uh, in Germany, um, work will continue at the European level. Dear Hubertus Heil, dear Minister, we are very happy to have you here. We are very much looking forward uh, to your um, speech with regards to this very important topic um, regarding due diligence laws. Dear Martin Schulz and uh, uh, dear Michael Vasiliadis, wherever you are, Andrea Arkas, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, guests uh, from trade unions, uh, the business sector, 
and other organizations are very happy to have this event here at, the, uh, at this point in time because there's a lot of echo uh, to the uh, due diligence law. And this um, actually uh, shows me we are talking about a topic that uh, many years ago, or a few years ago, was uh, just a marginal topic. So I'm... Um, I have the feeling um, that it was something, yeah, marginal. Um, it was uh, the um, it's it's a topic that uh, has entered uh, the interest of civil society and uh, general the general public as a whole. So thank you very much to the foundation and to you, Martin, personally, because I know that. Uh, the topic of human rights, since you have been active in politics, has been very important for you and you've uh, also achieved many things here. Um, I heard that with Claudia Roth and Otto von Habsburg, um, you uh, were the um, rapporteur for human rights with them, but I would like to also um, thank IGBCE for this event. I'm thinking often these days, I'm thinking um, often of a, a, a tri trip that I took uh, to uh, Ethiopia at the time, and uh, not only because when um, we uh, landed that I could actually get some Wi-Fi and uh, the results of the elections within our party, but I also remember that because I actually experienced very clearly the difference when German companies are actually taking care of their due diligence and what happens if they don't. So I actually experienced uh, a very positive example, a textile company where you know, there were decent uh, working conditions and uh, labor representation uh, producing uh, for the German market. And then also um, the opposite that I experienced um, that uh, is basically a capitalist hell where women were standing in chemicals up to their knees and where you could not feel any more dignity in a tannery they were working and uh, so uh, basically no rights and uh, so people being completely exploited. So I'm thinking of this uh, trip that uh, happened three years ago that seems a long time ago, um, uh, because uh, I'm thinking about what is also what is happening in Ethiopia at the moment with civil war going on with Abiy Ahmed. At the time, we uh, uh, were hoping he, he was the Nobel Prize win, uh, winner, and now in the meantime, this um, company is going down in uh, this country is going down in a civil war. So now this is the connection with our topic. So geopolitical and strategic uh, uh, issues uh, cannot be um, separated from human rights and supply chains. The crisis uh, in its multi faceted ways um, is hitting those who don't have a loud lobby. And I'm talking about workers, millions of workers in global supply chains. Even three years ago, their situation wasn't easy, but uh, since we've had these multiple crises, the, uh, uh, the situation has been worsening. So the uh, COVID pandemic uh, um, led to the loss of many jobs, 100,000s um, in the textile industry in Bangladesh and in India and also in Ethiopia. We all know the causes. To, uh, many orders uh, were cancelled because uh, many shops had to close down and uh, produced uh, goods to some extent couldn't be sold. And now, Martin Schulz also mentioned this, uh, since uh, the beginning of this year, the 24th of um, February, we've had the attack against Ukraine. Um, it uh, means not only suffering for the people uh, there, but it is also um, destroying jobs and is also putting a lot of pressure on global supply chains. Ladies and gentlemen, also here in Germany, the dreadful consequences can be felt. And uh, I would like to thank Michael Vasiliadis for its, his uh, contribution in um, the Commission to actually uh, control gas prices. But the high uh, cost of living is hitting not only people in Germany, 
but also in Germany, we uh, will be challenging, uh, we will be facing economic and social challenges. And of course, we want to maintain cohesion in our country because we know that um, um, uh, Mr. Putin is quite deliberately using all these means in order to um, um, damage uh, us and other countries. So it is our, our, uh, it's, it, the, the goal is to destabilize um, our democracies, and he must not be successful. So that's why many things are being done in order to guarantee supply security of supplies when it comes to gas and to also reduce the burden for people with a low or mid income or to also um, uh, guarantee jobs. Why am I talking about this? Because we have to ask ourselves in these uh, times of crisis management where we are focusing on the national level, um, uh, the question is can we only uh, focus on crisis management? No, because those who think that uh, human rights uh, and supply chains is, is, is just uh, good to have um, is eluding themselves. And so uh, the supply chains are very important for our businesses, and only sustainable supply chains uh, will be more resi resilient in times of crisis. And those who th uh, think that we don't have to take care of this is also losing themselves politically, because in difficult times we uh, shouldn't only focus on uh, the problems of our citizens, and uh, that we can't just take um, advantage of others. So uh, we have to strengthen human rights along supply chains. I would like to... Uh, mentioned three preconditions that are very important for our work in this connection. First of all, in Germany, um, as a European and very strong global industrial play player, we have to uh, serve as an example. We Global um, value creation and sustainability are no contradictions. So it is good that our Supply Chain Act and it's a long name in German. Um, <laughs> it also has to do with the many negotiations that we had to do. So the German Supply Chain Act um, uh, entered in force in 2022, or 20, it will be entering in 2023. What is this about? Uh, we will systematically re register human rights uh, breaches. So it's a risk-based ap approach, uh, so companies that don't have to face uh, all uh, risks, but they have to um, uh, face um, primarily the uh, largest risks. Uh, it, this act gives a clear orientation. The implementation will be monitored, and um, we will also support companies uh, and capacitate them that they can actually deal with this act. It is very important because there's also this uh, big discussion about the, this act, uh, but we have to say it, just, it didn't just fall from the sky. So it's the result of long negotiations with regards to what is necessary and what is possible. So our uh, act is oriented by international standards that are very well known, especially core elements of, of human rights due diligence uh, that the United Nations adopted. And the, uh, as feasibility is very important, this act will also enter into force in phases as from 2023 for uh, companies that have uh, m more than 3,000 members of staff and, and after that uh, for companies that have 1,000 or more uh, members of staff. So, so it gives uh, people on the sub supply chain a strong voice because for the first time German NGOs and trade unions can go to German courts uh, if um, people's rights or human rights are violated. violated. Um, and uh, this is very important that this opportunity or this uh, possibility is uh, is there and uh, it was a, co a compromise to say, okay, at least we can make sure if uh, civil uh, uh, law liability uh, is that uh, we strengthen um, human rights and uh, that uh, n not only in 
uh, a German courts, uh, um, can we take people to, to court? So for um, uh, this law, we also changed uh, the um, Company um, Constitution Act. Ladies and gentlemen, many of you might know it was a very long and a very difficult path uh, to reach this result. Many people have been engaged uh, here in this context or even for decades and it's a very important uh, 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 step from corporate social responsibility to due diligence and I would like to thank all those who have been very committed and um, all Without this engagement in trade unions, NGOs, but also in many companies that have served as models, we would not have reached this point today. And I would like to talk about the second precondition. We need a um, guaranteed legal framework in Europe, also for economic reasons. It's about a level playing field. It's about making sure that the companies that are uh, serving as models and uh, that they uh, who comply with due diligence that they don't have any disadvantages so that's why i have been fighting for european legislation and d during the G german eu presidency it was our initi initiative and uh, all uh, countries um, endorsed the, this and uh, the commission had to take an, an initiative and it has actually um, presented a good proposal. The member states um, of the European Parliament will, or the European Parliament will discuss uh, this and Martin Schulz has already announced this from his experience. He, you know how demanding this process is and how, how much double talk uh, goes on during these type of processes. But uh, Without double talk, and I can say um, that we as a government are supporting this draft law, and uh, we have three preconditions in the coalition agreement under which uh, we will uh, approve this legal framework. We will approve um, if uh, the directive is sufficiently um, effective. Secondly, the directive uh, does not go below the international standards of the UN, and thirdly, that uh, SMEs uh, should not be overcharged. So it's also about propor proportionality here. But you can uh, be sure that, uh, uh, as um, I'm as I'm responsible for this topic, I will definitely fight because I'm sure that we should not. Um, miss this opportunity. In the course of the last few months, I um, received a letter from the uh, supply chain letter uh, uh, initiative. And from this letter, I could see uh, that the, uh, there is a concern that the Commission might be uh, not taking the necessary measures. Uh, no, I don't think that is the case. Um, we are supporting an EU um, uh, regulation uh, that wouldn't have been possible before. So um, I would like to very briefly touch upon five central aspects where we see the opportunity to actually uh, adopt um, and implement a far-reaching law. So civil law liability it will be guaranteed for compensation and uh, what the um, details will be will be very interesting in the trilateral di di dialogue. But as a coalition, and this is definitely uh, also the instruction to the negotiators, um, um, civil uh, law liability. Secondly, at the European level, also, the trade unions will get a strong role to play in this context. Yes, and thirdly, um, in a safe harbour um, regulation, um, that uh, um, if companies get together in initiatives and if uh, standards are existent, then uh, these the safe harbour should be possible. But it has to be clear standards and they shouldn't... Uh, um, be ambiguous in their effectiveness. And fourth, we welcome the approach of the uh, European Commission to focus on the entire supply chain. And fifth, and we would like to also 
um, uh, protect the environment in this context. I mean, these are the things that are most important for us in the negotiations. And I think this uh, shows us that we also share the same goals uh, as uh, trade unions and civil society groups and NGOs, but also of many companies uh, that have been very engaged in the process. The proposal by the Commission is quite ambitious and good, but in uh, some points we will have to put on some pressure um, and it affects especially the last um, precondition uh, that I mentioned. If we are successful at the European level, then this is also a good basis for an international regulation because that's what we need, because global, e uh, global economy needs global rules. And that's why we have also made this topic a topic on our agenda of the G7 uh, um, presidency. So we uh, had a meeting in Wolfsburg with the other ministers of, of labor, and I could see that uh, uh, people are endorsing um, our, our plans, and I'm very happy that at, in Elmau, um, we stand, sent out a, a, a strong sing, sing, signal backed by uh, Olaf Scholz, and the G7 have committed themselves to um, uh, work on a, to a, uh, towards a con consensus in terms of human rights and also binding rules, and uh, this is quite a lot of progress. So um, if we would like to um, build up on uh, existing organisations and structures, and uh, so I think that the European Union, and this is also one um, of our preconditions, that there's a negotiation mandate and uh, that also at the international level um, the process can be backed and accompanied. Ladies and gentlemen, all of this shows us uh, that uh, the National Act uh, has also um, motivated this debate at the European level and it's, it shows us that this topic is very important, especially in times of multiple crises. We all need to defend dem democratic rights and uh, in a solidarity way, or in a solidarity way, and uh, we have to make sure that global markets don't only make gains for only a few and losses for many. Um, it, I would like to also uh, f endorse this um, in the context of uh, the developments that we have been seeing uh, that have been leading to more protectionism or deglobalization. This is not our um, goal, uh, but uh, the friends of free trade uh, in the future should also be the friends of fair trade. And uh, this con these concerns regarding globalization and are undermining the acceptancy for open markets. So this is a very strong argument. Uh, and uh, we have also seen this in the debate of free trade zones and agreements, and especially uh, something that uh, you know was that it was dealt with, with by nerds, so-called nerds, so in CETA and TTIP. You could see thousands of people were out on the streets and there was a lot of fake news and uh, also things regarding the wrongdoings of uh, globalization. Uh, so we have an interest in open markets, however, we need fair uh, competition uh, conditions, but we also need to accept we must not uh, actually build up on exploitation when it comes to our well-being, not on child labour or coerced labour and not on the breaches of human rights. Either um, when it comes uh, to when we have to make sure that uh, we avoid uh, civil wars, etc. So it is also in our own interest that uh, we uh, don't only take care of human rights in our hemisphere, but uh, that we live up to our global responsibility. Now, there's a discussion that I've known for many years. So whose responsibility is this? So I will say, yes, human rights are a state uh, responsibility, uh, primarily in, in our constitution. Um, Article 1 states that uh, human dig 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 dignity is untouchable. Now, 
apart from the state responsibility, there are also company due diligence um, responsibilities. Both things are necessary, and I will say this in the interest of um, the economy and the business. Um, uh, we don't want to create laws uh, that will f um, torture companies. No, it's about fair competition uh, conditions and uh, to not uh, demand anything that is impossible. Of course, we also need to discuss the details, but I'm very happy that we reached this point that we created a German law and uh, that now at the European level we have this debate and uh, that, uh, yeah, I think the sends us a very important signal in these very difficult time times to create rules in the global markets uh, that don't violate uh, the human rights of others. So um, thank you very much for having me here. I wish you productive results. Thank you very much to the foundation, also the other foundation, for your hospitality and also for this forum, for this very important topic. Thank you very much. Hubertus, may I ask you back on stage? I'm sure you've noticed already the minister, unfortunately, of course, needs to leave soon. But if you will still give us a few moments, let us have a look at your very important speech. You touched upon it, multiple crises, war for aggression, global challenges. You touched upon the Zeit and went to the turning point in history. But at the same time, sending out a signal as minister for labor and a social democrat, saying that responsibility in supply chain, due diligence are important building blocks. And in our own interest still, why is it that our goals, are, there are concerns and these goals are left behind? Well, allow me to speak about crisis management. There's the concern that there is no time to also take care, or no energy is but to take care of other aspects. And my opinion is that's all the more reason we need to do it. There is always an excuse not to look at such important topics. And I've seen it many times looking at German Due Diligence Act. A lot of confederations said, well, there will be an EU solution on the EU level very soon, so why do we need a German law? And I'm very sure that the EU law would not never come about without the German law. And I've seen the same development now. People saying, well, we have the German Due Diligence Act now, so why do we need a regulation on the EU level? And my answer is this, at the, in the end it will be a compromise and I'm sending out this message also to trade unions because uh, there will not be one solution for one player, there will have to be a compromise and that goes also for the EU level. And at the same time, allow me to say that I'm very thankful and grateful that a lot of businesses, German companies and corporations are on board because they've understood, they've understood we need to protect people along global child um, supply chains. And this is not only good for your conscience, but also it will facilitate fair rules for the game, rules for the competition, and I think this is a great opportunity right now. I don't want to use this as an excuse. No, it's a very central topic, and I think looking at the debate in the past years, we ventured out on a different path. First, we tried out corporate social responsibility or businesses um, trying to uphold their own standards, but it didn't get us yield the results we wanted to see. And I have to admit that um, before 2015, I wasn't even interested much in the topic, but then I experienced it firsthand. There is a global connection, and uh, many people understand that it makes more sense to involve all interests in the interests of all. And that's something we've seen working with our trade partners like China, looking at forced labor. It's something that many people are interested in. And I'm 
delighted to see that we now have an act that proves that German businesses get involved and take on responsibility. In 78, you said it isn't this only about, uh, we heard the phrase, well, isn't it just only about football? Shouldn't it be only about soccer? Um, no, it's also about labor laws. Well, the topic is a relevant one, and everything is intellect. Of course, looking at the violation of human rights, looking at the World Championships that, are, uh, that will take place in Qatar shortly. You touched upon this minister looking at politics. You said it, it was a difficult fight to push this through on a German level. You mentioned this and highlighted it again, and we're delighted that your fight, or this fight, was successful. Now, looking at Germany, you touched upon five key elements, and where is it that Germany will have to continue the fight? Where is it particularly necessary? Now, looking at the German situation, we were focused mainly on civil society liability, and I learned a lot about civil law. Um, Dr. Stender, head of the respective department, is here. I'm married to a lawyer, and I also have a splendid lawyer as head of department, and he taught me a lot over the past few years. I learned that it's mo mainly about one thing, which law is applicable applicable, which law applies, looking at the supply chains around the world, where does due diligence apply? And we learned that looking at German law, it might apply, but you have to file suit in Pakistan, in, according to Pakistani law, and before Pakistani courts. And it's a difficult issue. Now the Supply Chain Act might be even more strict than German law. Looking at the German law again, there was an alternative to German law, and that is the regulation we put into place for the buffer as well in this context. If everyone is satisfied with this, I'm not sure the authorities might not be too happy about it. This and we would also need to take a closer look again and maybe amend accordingly. There are many out there who have concerns that we will be liable to U.S. lawsuits. I'm not so sure there, but it is um, essential and it's an important topic. Still looking at the coalition, I'm happy to say that we share the same opinion. It's not a private opinion. It's something, a position that we have together as a government coordinate with the Minister of Justice. So civil society liability is at the core of the issue and also looking at what's going on online. We've understood that it has to do with everyone involved. And it's important to get the relevant information. You said it, you've been to, you traveled to Ethiopia, so which rights apply? What are the rights of an tenory worker? What about civil liability and how can it be enforced? Many concerns get to us, words get, the words get to us, concerns about the climate crisis and looking at the German level, it's something that we achieved here in Germany. Now the topic is handed over to the European level, to the EU. I know you have to leave. I just wanted to tell you what the messages that get us. So we worked on this. We had fierce discussions, civil society, trade unions, confederations, associations, maybe even one or two representatives from the Global South that we managed to get on board virtually. So what is it you want to tell us? What's your message to all of us? Maybe I allow me to mention Karl Popper. It's about human action on moral aspects. So, what can a human person do? 
looking at the German law, uh, looking at NGOs, and looking at civil liability, but maybe it's not so much about discussions we have in the civil sphere. I think we should just make sure that these um, lawsuits don't even happen, so we can be take preventive action here, and that's why I support the safe harbor solution. I want, of course, in case of um, cross Netherlands, German companies need to be liable, but we have to make sure to have taken preemptive action and prove and show that businesses have taken have taken on their responsibility. So I'm happy that we've done everything we could. We didn't want to strike a false compromise. And to all of those who say that, I can say, no, we wanted to find an ambitious solution. We tried our best, not go for a wrongful compromise. But allow me just to send out the signal. It would be great to have trade unions and confederations, associations on board who say, we're ready to come to a compromise, to strike a compromise. Uh, give us something that we can work with, and that's the balance we have to strike. And both sides have to focus on the objective at the end of the day, because we want to make a contribution to a more just global world and to be able to uphold human rights that have already been ratified. I could be a, a bit, speak a bit more with more emotion it's about this. Uh, even th though I'm from northern Germany, I could say, well, we have more child labor now in the world, and it's something we need to tackle. There's also the risk that uh, the energy transition will fail because if we don't focus on raw materials, on precious metals. And this is my message to all of you. No, we will not be able to solve all the problems and make the world um, to, to, to make the world just a place, a fairer place by pushing one button. No, and I say this with all uh, seriousness, looking at the multiple crises, I think we shouldn't stand idly by. No, what we need is a stance, a strong stance, and to work hard for our position. Everyone can fight for that, and there are many things that were also quite successful. A lot of NGOs said, yes, um, what we've done is good, but it's not far enough. And I think that's what counts, being on the right way. Thank you so much, Hubertus. It was great having you. Thank you so much for being here. I'm very sure looking at what our minister achieved will influence our discussions, MSI, multi-stakeholder initiatives, liability, many things. War is something we touched upon already, and it's something we want to talk on now. And I'm, I can see you're very eager already. I'm very sure we will have time later on in the discussion that the representative of the Department for Human Rights will also get involved. Michael Vassiliadis, I think you heard it already. He cannot be here in person, unfortunately. I hope he successfully arrived in Bielefeld, where he will be part of the negotiations. Michael, are you there? I can see you already. Let me allow me to introduce you just briefly. Michael, was ja, das I know. I'm sure you know him. Allow me to. You are chair of the. I, G, B, C, E, and that goes without saying you're also part of trade union all Europe. You were with us 
two years ago already, and this was the last event that took place two years ago. My colleague was involved as well. I can see her here in the room. You had fierce discussion. You were part of the discussions, also on a global, in a global context. I'm very sure you have a strong position also today looking at the role of trade unions in today's world. Michael, I'm so glad that you're here. It looks like you're in your hotel and thank you for being so flexible. Michael, you have the floor. Dank, thank you Martin. so much, Martin. Um, I think Robertus already had to leave colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Und, um it is true, hotel. I it's am uh, in a hotel room and the Nächtliches, aber äh, Verhandlungsergebnis gleich tariffs. ratifizieren muss. Ich muss mich also ein bisschen beeilen, weil for zumindest die tägliche Kernaufgabe der Gewerkschaft, nämlich in dieser Inflation für ordentliche Löhne so zu sorgen, the respective mich commission Nichtsdestotrotz downstairs um, negotiating on important aspects. So, so looking at, I'm really happy that we have the follow-up um, conference today based on the event that took place two years ago, looking at Marcus and Robertus already did a splendid job in showing us the context, and I can only add to that now. Allow me to say that I think that this crisis that we're confronted with now in, against the backdrop of the corona pandemic and the climate crisis, that all of these have made one thing clear. Supply chains and responsibility are clear. Supply chains have an impact or have influence human rights, the environment, and the environment. And that's one thing we learned. Supply chains, the way we had, we used to, have them with all problems involved, are but one form of a more or less regulated, rather irregulated globalization that is mainly cost driven. The question, the issue mainly was where do we produce what for whom, by whom? Looking at Supply chains and and sind bei der looking at whether continents Produkten, are resilient, whether ISO our supply are chains are und ich jetzt resilient, nicht davon, dass man das alles that there was one thing that sollte, was ignored. I'm not even Standorte saying aufnehmen, that we need to bring production back to Germany. Uh, no, it's about quality. And quality is something that we have not focused on enough. And that has caused our issues and then our, the problems we've run into. And that's something we want to fix with the Due Diligence Act, looking at human rights, at universal rights, but also looking at the SDGs. So the goals that were agreed under the roof of the UN, the Sustainable Development Goals. So I think we have a global consensus, consensus a position on a global level. Still, every in our everyday work, we need to make sure that this law is adhered to. The IB, the IGBCE has set its own standards, and we want to do our job in our businesses, and we want to approach companies and want to make clear contributions to get to very clear supply chain management that can also be followed up on. So why is that? Well, Bert has said it already. There's one thing we need. We need clear framework conditions and clear laws that are safe and secure to make sure that our companies, our businesses know what they will be confronted with in the context of these topics. And there's another level as well. We need to make sure that this works in everyday life. It needs 
to we need to be able to integrate this in management systems and we need to make sure that people can actually do this so it won't work if we just come up with norms and rules and regulations that might make sense and are right but cannot be implemented so everyone who enters this discussion also needs to shed light on whether this can actually be put into practice. We cannot ignore this. And trade unions play a vital role here. Our members, our, the employees, the workers, they have the look, they have the perspective from inside and from the outside and globally so. We can organize ourselves, but also have the responsibility to build up structures in the businesses that work. So my message to all of those who are very active in NGOs, it's an umbrella term that I'm sure doesn't apply to all, but looking at the issue itself, I would just like to ask, to call upon everyone to also enter the dialogue, to really participate. So why do I say that? Well, looking at what's happening, I think there is a clear line um, and the, I'm not sure that all the messages we receive should be replied to because they cross a line. I will not mention names here, but there are companies involved that are suppliers of suppliers of suppliers of suppliers and sometimes it's difficult to follow along the line of supply chains and in the end the one on top who causes or causes the whole supply chain is the the one who ha is responsible and the entire supply chain is not considered because it's too complicated or it's not unclear. Mm -hmm. So that's a, an argument that did not convince me. Looking at this very example, of course other examples made sense. Looking at management, I think it's important to look at the supply chain management to make sure that transparency is there and that everyone involved works together. So I think trade unions have a vital role here. I also wouldn't say that our role is clear to everyone. This has a moral aspect for us as well, which is necessary, but which also is not enough. We usually agree here, Hubert has also said it, however, human rights need to be facilitated on all levels and politics has to do its work here because policy is something that's not considered by everyone on every level to the same degree. But allow me to get back to participation of everyone involved. I think it would be good looking at the norms, looking at transparency, looking at lawsuits, looking at courts. I think it would be good to have a quality certification of every for everyone involved. At least I think it would be relevant that all main players so that that doesn't go for NGOs or organizations who speak up in public. That is their right, of course. But looking at a more systematic approach, I think it would be good in order to actually be able to implement this law worldwide. So I think we need certified actors, certified players to make sure that players can actually be participate, participate and be involved. If that is not achieved, I think we will lose ourselves in the process and will not be able to find solutions and actually be successful. I think there's a good example from Brazil, Mercadinho in Brazil, this is
this touches on the topic of the dike and lawsuits took place and we made a lot of money available, 1 million euros. And by doing so, we made sure that this case ended up in court. It is one part of quality. I don't want to go into too much detail here, just to say that we can rely on the fact that there are clear political procedures and also environmental procedures and to make sure that annual meetings of companies don't end up being strange scenarios for people to speak on the stage. So it's a good thing, I would say, for businesses all in all, because it will make sure that business can develop their own sustainability further. Sustainability is already there in most businesses and it's in their own interest because they in the coming years need to focus on reducing CO2 emissions in the coming years and in that context the SDGs play a vital role. But looking at human rights, so the most fundamental rights is something where there's very limited discussions. It's something people agree on. But it's left at that, unfortunately, in most cases. As trade unions allowed me to also emphasize that there is, there are different rights, involved rights of assembly rights of free association, labor rights, of course. And then one thing is the case, usually people just try to fulfill local rights and that is not enough. So looking at the SDGs and looking at the whole discussion, I think this can be a driver as well because there is the right on the one hand, but we also need to make sure that there's also facilitation on the other hand, that all actors can participate, can be involved. So that's where I want to get to in the future. But of course, things need to be clear. Everything else that's been touched upon already, something that I can only support, the very special role of trade unions, of course. We've had few discussions on this, but we agree on most of the main points. The issue is how do we manage this and not only how can we organize our demands that are very clear already. Before I conclude, allow me to highlight one more thing. I think associations, so, Employers come together, found associations and try to transfer their sole responsibility and group all of this together under one roof and this might make things easier, but allow me to demand that should this be the case, should this happen, should we have those associations and those forms of cooperation that then we need to take trade unions on board because we can help show the way that was always good when it comes to working with businesses. So pragmatism, a call for pragmatism for businesses to get involved on all levels of the SDGs and the Supply Chain Act and that I really hope to be able to report on this again during the next conference. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Michael, uh, that uh, despite uh, the difficulties that you had this morning that you made it possible to take part in this conference. So I hope you have a few minutes left before 
before you will be able to also uh, announce the good results, hopefully good results of the collective bargaining negotiations. Yes, very important aspects you mentioned. It was very interesting to say there have to be quality criteria. And if you think this through, and uh, with the last words uh, that you mentioned, and where does Heil also said, if companies uh, join, to, uh, join forces in industrial or sectorial initiatives, so in uh, the chemical industry, there's a, a, a standard is being developed for the chemical pharmaceutical company companies. I mean, what would your main criteria in this context be? Well, one thing would be that all companies need to stick to transparent criteria that can actually be traced. Of course, uh, there are detailed information where you have to be, okay, a little bit careful. Uh, I mean, uh, it is something that is being done through notary or own lawyers and having certification because it has to do with competition law. But the main topics we are talking about, I don't really see this need. So it has to be, there has to be a public database that it needs to be accessible, and I also recommend this in this context, uh, so that uh, no fake news arise or are, are being produced. Secondly, what uh, will be necessary in terms of information systems? I, I also talked about labor rights, and I would like to thank uh, the Foundation also for this uh, very long-standing cooperation, excellent cooperation. So you also have uh, uh, offices in countries where it's not that easy to implement human rights. And through the, such institutions, it's good to create a network that, on a continuous basis, in a transparent way, it, at a conference, comments publicly what is happening in the world. And thirdly, and uh, I mean, of course, there are limits to that, uh, but uh, also to open interests uh, of the big companies in B2B. Uh, this has already been done, because also this, these are very interesting information, or this is also inter interesting information for clients um, to have uh, social labeling. Uh, such as other labels uh, that also uh, make it possible to trace certain information. And then I also expect that uh, if uh, we're talking about the chemical and pharmaceutical industry, so uh, if there is a sectorial initiative that you as an industry, uh, that you commit to topics, pushing for these topics in the companies, and uh, not only based on legal obligations, um, I would like to also f uh, talk about uh, trade union rights, labor rights, etc., in this context, so that uh, at all locations and along the entire supply chain, that uh, uh, you need to uh, guarantee these rights. And the last aspect is there has to be the right, I'm, I'm imagining a board of such an initiative, uh, I, that this board or those who are responsible in the organizations in all places of the world every day or each and every day can actually take a sample and uh, draw samples I mean the, the, uh, at uh, their own cost I mean it can't be the burden of the companies necessarily but uh, there has to be access for that kind of thing Yeah, so uh, we have uh, a big audience also online and also a smaller audience, however, very valuable audience also in this hall. And we would like to have a little bit of interaction here. So we are ready to accept 
questions from the virtual audience. So the first question is, what a direct influence do German trade unions have on the implementation of the supply chain due diligence, diligence access, such as in uh, Bangladesh, India, and Pakistan? So how is it controlled and monitored, the implementation? How is it uh, uh, monitored worldwide? Uh, just uh, re reporting or just reporting will not be su sufficient. Yes, I can be very clear here, uh, but then, uh, unfortunately, I also need to uh, leave. So, um, you know, if necessary, I'll also answer questions in writing afterwards. Now, the current state is how do we control this in uh, Bangladesh, India, and uh, Pakistan? Not at all, because we can't. And uh, I already talked about the corresponding infrastructure n neither in terms of information nor in terms of uh, personnel. Uh, is in place uh, through our industrial global. We take uh, samples, but these are not entire supply chains that are being monitored. Uh, now, these are regional campaigns we are talking about, which m raise awareness. That is uh, the classical campaigning path. But uh, I also talked about what we are doing at the moment in the multinationals, the German multinationals and the European ones. Uh, where we are sitting in co-determination commissions, we are uh, building up a supply chain information system which is based on this new act that we have just discussed. Th that means when it comes to the topic of, uh, well, we're not uh, in an infancy st stage, but when it comes to, to operational control and implementation, uh, quite a few things need to be done, but we're on, on a good path, I'd say. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, yes, you need to leave urgently. We would have another few minutes, but we wish you uh, the best of the best, and uh, hopefully you will be announced uh, something positive about the, the outcomes in Wiesbaden, but I'm pretty sure you will be. So, thank you very much. So, we have a small adaptation. I don't know where Francisca is, but um, so we will change the agenda slightly we would have a slightly longer coffee break, which uh, is for those who are present here in this room. This is a good piece of news, I guess, for the virtual audience. Uh, maybe, um, you know, you can have a little bit of a biological break. Um, we will continue at 10.45, and uh, we will be expecting the rapporteur from European Parliament for the um, due digitalism law, um, Lara Walters. We are very much looking forward to having her here, and we are very happy to see all of you together after the break.
Dear audience, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, dear listeners, uh, we will now be continuing with our program so that we can have the full uh, potential of time for our next speaker. I hope that Lara Walters will uh, be tuning in from Strasbourg and uh, she will be participating in a digital way. Hello, Lara. So we will be continuing. Uh, we will be looking at the European level and we will be looking into the debates regarding a European due diligence law. Even if um, I, I suppose that everybody knows Lara Walters, nevertheless, I would like to uh, uh, introduce her. She's a um, social democrat and expert uh, on the supply chain law, and she's a member of the European Parliament. She's a, a Dutch social democrat, and she's here because she's the rapporteur for the EU due diligence law. Lara Walters, I'm ho uh, hopefully you can hear the interpretation. Can you hear the interpretation into English? Can you just give us a say, sign? Yes, it seems to be working. I hope that you can hear me in English. So um, we will be looking forward to uh, listening to you to see what the status quo is at the European level regarding the law and what uh, the crucial points are, what the um, bones of content might be in order to also make sure that uh, rights are being guaranteed for people worldwide. We have been uh, discussed, we have already discussed on many occasions, and um, we've listened to Hubert Schreil, our Minister of Labour, and Michael Vasiliadis, and uh, the President of um, uh, IGBCE. They talked about different topics, civil liability and the necessity of a multi-stakeholder text of civil liability. We talked about climate and environment and generally speaking about the question how uh, urgent these laws are in this global crisis and they're also part of the responses to these crises. Dear Lara, uh, first of all you will be holding a short presentation and then we will have a little bit of time uh, to ask some questions to you in Brussels, I was going to say, but you're not, you're, you're in Strasbourg, right? <laughs> so you have the floor. Thank you very much. So I'm sorry, I, I'm just, uh, Lara Waters will be speaking in English. I just um, forgot to mention this. So if uh, anybody in this hall needs interpretation, there's also interpretation into German. Now you have the floor, Lara. Thank you very much. Um, guten Morgen, and I'm so sorry, I will be doing this in English. It's a little bit easier for me, given that the negotiations here are going on in English. Um, what is difficult, though, is that I can hear myself back. If there's anything to be done about that technically, that would be very helpful. Is this better? I will try again. Yes. Is it like better this, now? I think Is it better? it's less. Perfect. Um, good morning. Thank you very much to the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung for, for having me. Um, thank you for the great program that you have organized today. And I'm really glad to see so much um, interest and attention, um, even after uh, there might be a certain uh, Lieferkettengesetz fatigue. I can imagine in Germany, um, you have gone through all of this um, before and not even that long ago. Um, so thank you very much for, for all those involved. Um, it's, it's very much welcome here because it adds to the pressure and I think it adds to ultimately um, our uh, success here because I have a feeling that this law is starting to be too big to fail, um, although um, we're, we have a, a lot of work ahead of us. Um, and just to recall, I think also in, in this um, audience, I'm sure it's been done before, but um, what we're talking about here is a European uh, law for 27 member states um, that would reach beyond the EU in certain ways um, on responsible business conduct. And the reason that we're doing that is um, because of examples of deforestation, because of examples of forced labor, because of examples of environmental degradation at the hands of large companies, um, because of children picking cocoa beans um, for our children um, 
to uh, to put a chocolate spread on their on their bread in the morning, um, and because we read about uh, people jumping from windows, putting together our consumer technology um, items in uh, in places far away, and I find it very important to recall those things. And I don't want to be bombastic uh, on a Tuesday morning throwing examples like that um, out there, but I think it's very very important at all times to remember why we are making this law. And it is because of all these real world, real life examples. Um, and the reason that I start with that is that if we don't start with that, then I think we risk um, not taking as a starting point for this law risk and um, the real life effects and the impacts that we are after, but rather taking leverage as our starting point. And what I mean with that is the starting point here should be what are the most salient, most uh, dramatic possibilities of damage, suffering, harm, and so forth um, at the hands of our companies if we are not careful, if we don't perform due diligence, if we don't have laws on responsible business conduct. And those risks should be the starting point for us. Um, and those risks should be the ones that even if difficult, even if complicated, we need companies um, to look into. That's a very different approach from taking leverage as a starting point. Um, if you take leverage as a starting point, then you take as a starting point how much power, how much um, how much uh, a possibility to change anything does a company have. But if you take that as a starting point, then you end up into um, a system that will uh, address the risks that might not be the most salient risks, that might not be the most important. Then you will be, be uh, conducted into companies um, doing something in the largest contracts they have, possibly in the first tier um, where the risks might not be, and at the end of the day, um, not creating the impact that we're really after. And I find it very important to, uh, at all times, remember that starting point, which coincidentally, of course, is the OECD and the UN starting point. Um, and the reason that we need to remember that as well is that ultimately, I think this law is about uh, recreating uh, some balance. I think uh, large companies have rights and they have duties. Their rights are um, making a profit um, and uh, operating internationally, but their duties are doing that responsibly. Um, and I think that this law, if we get it right, can restore some of the balance that maybe since the, the 90s, the early 90s has been lost somewhat. I think it's about honesty. I think it's about small companies competing with larger companies in a fair way, in a way that is just and that doesn't allow cowboy companies to cut corners, that allows those large companies that really are doing their best and that are trying um, to give those a fair, fair chance and not be um, outcompeted by those cutting corners. I think it's about consumers, um, I think, who often now can't see the wood for the trees. Um, I'd like consumers to be uh, shopping with a sense of calm, a sense of that what is in our shops and what has been uh, imported into Europe um, is something that they can be sure about without individually needing to, needing to do uh, research. And of course, this is about sustainability because there is no way that we can achieve the Green Deal um, objectives that we all set together without the involvement of companies. Um, those for me are, that's the, the starting point. If you allow me, I will just make sure that the light turns on again in my room. It's not a given in Strasbourg where we're also saving energy very rightly. The light won't turn on, okay. Um, why do we need this in a more concrete way? We need this because if we uh, don't do this now, then we will end up with 27 laws. And I'm sure that I'm, I'm saying things here that have been mentioned uh, before this morning, um, but I think that currently there's projects on the way on a law similar to your, your German uh, law, which I think will enter into force at the beginning of next year. But there's initiatives going on in my own country, in Austria, in Belgium, um, and of course there's already the French uh, duty of vigilance. Um, so it's about avoiding that we end up with a patchwork that doesn't do anything uh, for companies. It's about clarity. Um, and of course, and I'm sure this has men been mentioned before, it's about making sure that the, um, the, the standards from the, from the past that were voluntary, that those turn into something um, with, with impact. Um, I think that there's a lot of voluntary initiatives and sector initiatives that have been extremely helpful, but I think the take of take up of them hasn't been large enough, and that's why why we need to act. Um, what I would like from this law, um, 
I've said it, a law that actually makes a difference, um, but also a law that is workable. And that's much easier said than done. And I'm, I'm sure that you, from your experience with the German law, um, know what I'm talking about. I think that um, companies are asking us to be precise. They are saying we need clarity. We need to know what is expected of us. And at the same time, I don't think I know a single lawmaker in Brussels who hasn't heard the argument of um, one size fits all um, is not is not a possibility for companies. We cannot have something um, that is overly prescriptive. Um, there is too much red tape. If you overregulate, um, you cannot take away all the freedom from companies with things that don't work for all the different sectors. Because of course, what we're doing here is we're creating a law that is um, applicable to sectors. Um, not only uh, uh, such as minerals and 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 garments, uh, but also possibly technology companies, the financial sector. And so what that means is that we need to zoom out to some extent to make sure that um, what we create does fit all. But if we do that, then we are vulnerable to the arguments of, well, this is not precise enough. We still don't understand what is expected. Um, that is a, a tension that, that will be difficult to deal with and that we will need to find uh, replies to. Um, there is um, that we need to find replies to, uh, of course, as I mentioned, uh, uh, based on what works and based on not reinventing the wheel. And with that, I mean the the OECD and the UN guiding principles, of course, as a as a basis to our uh, to our work. Um, I'm very happy that there is a proposal from the European Commission because there was a time when this was not a given, when it wasn't certain that we would have that proposal. But that said, zooming in on that proposal a little bit, um, I think that the Commission has tried to please uh, too many people with its proposal. And I think what we've ended up with is something that um, doesn't quite make sense and that tries a little bit of everything, but that doesn't uh, guarantee the, the impact that we need or the clarity that we need. Um, and what I mean here, and at the risk of repeating other speakers who have come before me this month and have identified these problems, but um, I think some problems are the uh, contractual clauses or rather the possible overemphasis on those contractual clauses. Because what I would be afraid of is those contractual clauses that are mentioned in the text becoming a um, becoming the type of uh, the the uh, due diligence that companies do without um, doing their their proactive due diligence, their tailored due diligence that is needed for them and their company, and saying, well, actually, why don't we use contractual clauses and, and, and contracts with others down our supply chain to discharge of our due diligence? Um, that, of course, is a worst case scenario, but it's it's one that we need to be very mindful of. And that's why I don't want an overemphasis on contractual clauses. And um, they are a tool in the toolbox. And I also think it's important um, to give a little bit more direction to what type of contractual clauses we're talking about. Um, because in my mind, that's uh, responsible contractual clauses, i.e. contracts that don't just discharge liability um, or responsibility for that matter, but that have uh, mutual responsibility clauses. Um, I also think that the, the concept of an established business relationship is a very uh, dangerous one. I think it's one that's open to gaming. I think it's one that's open to um, a, a, a tweaking in such a way that it suits a company. And again, I think it emphasizes where companies have leverage rather than where the biggest risks are. Um, so doing due diligence over your established business relationships where arguably the big risks won't be and where you can make a difference, um, but not taking as a starting point where the real damage might be, I think, is uh, something that needs to be uh, that we need to move away from. Um, other points that I have difficulty with is large carve outs for the financial industry, the lack of mention of remedy, generally um, the lack of a, a real uh, human rights-based due diligence, uh, the lack of, of, of proper access to justice for, for victims. Um, in the European Parliament's uh, proposal on this, we had reversed the burden of proof. Um, we had said that since there are always, um, or in so many cases, there, there are big barriers to justice. And since often in countries um, far away, it's difficult to, to, to hold our European companies to account, it's important that we address that. And I don't think that's being done sufficiently in the Commission proposal. I also think that good governance provisions are missing, um, provisions on, on corruption, um, on good governance, and what it is we expect there from companies when they examine their value chains. Um, 
I think that we need to focus more on stakeholder consultation. And I think in the Commission's proposal, stakeholder consultation is seen rather like a uh, burden than like an asset. Um, and I think that the people closest to problems and closest um, to, to workers on the ground have a lot of valuable insights to share and incorporating those into the due diligence process is very important and is not something that should be seen as um, a, tick a tick box exercise or something that only happens once the damage already has been done. Because ultimately what we're after here is a law that in the best of cases would, would prevent harm from happening. Um, SMEs and the, the scope in general of this proposal is another problem I see. I think that SMEs, either way, they will be impacted by this proposal. And for me, um, the European Parliament's approach in the report we wrote before this, which was adopted with a large majority, was that SMEs and high risk sectors should be included here. Um, and I think that's important because either way, if we don't want them to be on the receiving end of the demands of larger companies, then we need to set out what those boundaries are. And I think that given um, SMEs' uh, needs on financing, and given the demands that are already put to them also by, by, by banks often, um, it would be good to, to help there, including um, measures such as financial support. Um, but leaving them out altogether, certainly those in high-risk sectors, I think, would be a missed opportunities. Um, and lastly, I think directors' duties are making very clear what it is we expect in terms of oversight and in terms of boardroom involvement um, is something that uh, we need to look at more closely. Um, in terms of the road ahead, I think you're 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 interested in in what the 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 up to the the uh, the, the the minute as we speak status is on this. Uh, so the European Parliament has now started its its work in in earnest. Um, my report on this will be released on the seventeenth of November. Um, other members in the Legal Affairs Committee which is the lead draft committee on this, will have until the 30th of November to respond with their own amendments on this. Um, and uh, we hope that um, we can uh, start negotiating on this with member states in the middle of next year at the latest, um, with a view to an agreement by the end of the year also at the latest. Um, you might be aware that in the European Parliament, there's many different committees involved in this. There's many opinion giving committees or committees that have special competences on this, um, which has caused a little bit of a uh, delay on our side. Uh, that's not the first delay, of course. We had a delay in, in the, at the Commission's uh, uh, side previously. Um, I think that shows the amount of interest, the amount of pressure, and the amount of the sheer vastness, I suppose, of this of this project. Um, but I think that if we can get to an end uh, on this, if we can get to a, uh, a, um, a law that is carried by a majority in this House that companies think is uh, sufficiently workable and that civil society tells me is uh, sufficiently impactful by the end of this mandate, then I think that um, we have achieved a, um, a huge deal. Um, that won't be easy. There's a lot of work ahead. Um, but I think that uh, for me, as long as we, we keep our eyes on the prize and we um, keep uh, being mindful of um, what this law is actually supposed to do at the end of the day and not get sidetracked into um, a tick box exercise for companies, um, I think that we can get there. Um, I will leave it there and I'm very open to uh, your questions if time allows. Thank you so much, Lara Voltes. That was very interesting. And we looked at the most crucial, most interesting, most controversial issues of the developments looking at implementing a EU law supply chain act. So now is the moment to pose questions. Is, is anyone here in the room who would like to pose a question? We have microphones ready, waiting for you. If not, if you like to pose a question, please tell us your name. You can speak in German. Um, hello, my name is uh, Stefan Schwarzhofer from Continental AG. Um, oh, I also have the same feedback loop that you had. Um, um, my question is, um, the European proposal also puts the duty of care to protect human rights of states more into focus than the German law. You did not elaborate on this point. What is your position here on, on the duty uh, of states to support companies in the implementation? So there was a bigger passage in the European law, which is basically not really there in the German one. 
Vielen Dank für diese Frage. Ich nehme dann noch eine Frage auf ähm, aus dem digitalen Raum. Ähm, Publikum, hier ist die Frage, welche Form... No, I'd like to to include a question from the virtual audience. What about requirements to boards of companies? Shouldn't, uh, what about the leverage they have? And then a third question, if you'll allow me, it was mentioned already, looking at the risk-based uh, approach of the law. We spoke about this in with regard to the German law as well. So how can we make sure that everyone speaks about the same risks in this discussion. It's something that we circle back to time and again. It's about protecting human and environmental rights as good as possible already preventively. So, so isn't there the risk that economic risk will be assessed differently than environmental risk and in the end we will end up not speaking about the same risk. So these are the three questions. Thank you. Um, I will do my best on those. Uh, I'm not sure I understood all of them 100%, but I will, I'll try. Um, and perhaps the extra sound could be turned off again. Thank you. Um, so I interpret the last question about um, ensuring that companies go after the most salient risks uh, to their business models or to their particular sector. Um, and uh, indeed, that's an important question. And I hope it's a question um, that will be uh, leading for companies. I hope it's, it's, it's a question that is discussed even in boardrooms um, where there's, there's, you know, a real... Um, there's a real deliberation on, on what is it that we need to focus our, our, our energy and our money on. How do we take decisions properly on prioritization, on what is the most salient and the most important? Um, how can we uh, make a, a, a logical decision on what we do first, what we do second, or what we do um, and what we don't as a, as a company? And of course, it's true that if you look at a company that imports um, uh, 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 consumer products uh, from China with, with large containers, then uh, you might need to look at environmental uh, risk, whereas if you uh, deal with a, uh, a, a garment uh, a sector and you have a, a company that, um, that does fashion, then of course uh, a, a, a risk of child labor will be more salient. Um, so there might be clear-cut cases, but there might be um, issues where not. And I think what's important there is that discussions are held in a, a bona fide way, um, and we will know that um, since it's important that companies will know and show um, what their due diligence process is and why they've taken the decisions that we've taken, um, that they've taken. But to do that, we need to make sure that know and show, um, as per the OECD principles and the UN guiding principles, is part and parcel of this law. And that knowing and showing what you're doing is a duty that's taken very seriously um, and not something that can be twisted into whatever suits the company uh, best. Um, so maybe that for my for my answer to that question. In terms of um, boards and their responsibility, um, I uh, often borrow the the I think German word Chefsache from from you. Um, I really hope that it's something that is used in German in the Netherlands. We we use it a lot, um, but maybe it's one of those those false translations. Either way, what I mean with that is I find it very important that um, that boards take responsibility for due diligence. Now there's arguments that say. Why would boards need to do this specifically? There's already um, a whole pile of directors' duties, and wouldn't that be duplication? Because either way, at the end of the day, um, directors are always responsible. At the same time, I hear companies telling me that very often it's unclear where due diligence responsibilities lie, whether it's with compliance, whether it's with the legal department, whether it's with um, the, the, the sales or the, the, the purchasing department. Um, whether it's maybe with the CSR department, which might be more of a, a public relations department making, making uh, glossy brochures. Um, if there's that type of unclarity, then that cannot be good. And um, I, I sometimes mention here the example of Rio Tinto opening a mine in Australia, where I think it cost 
millions and millions and millions in legal fees and in uh, in uh, costs because their mind couldn't open because what hadn't been done was consult the local community which was an aboriginal community on the place of their mine now if it costs that much money for a company then you would assume that the ceo um, would be um, would be involved then you would you would assume that he would have knowledge of this in the end the ceo in question had to depart because Either he, he, he said he didn't know or communication didn't travel up to the boardroom. But those situations um, need to be avoided because that sort of human suffering um, cannot just be uh, at the hands of the legal department or the purchasing department. Um, so whatever happens there, I want to make sure that, uh, that uh, there's clarity on, on where the buck stops. Um, I think the last question or the first question was of the duty of states to support companies. Um, I don't know if I fully understood that, that question. I'm assuming this is not about the duty to protect versus the duty to respect, but rather about, let's say, flanking measures for um, companies or about uh, supervisors that can be sparring partners for, for companies. I think there's a range of things that we've talked about in the European Parliament before on how companies can be helped in uh, performing due diligence. And I'm not... Um, dogmatic in that I think that uh, it'd be very important that companies also have access to proper data, that they have access to um, a, a supervisor, at least um, some uh, some type of, of knowledgeable authority that can help when it has questions, for instance, on the most salient risks um, and uh, that that there's uh, that there's support available, and for smaller companies, even even financial support. Um, I also think that data uh, and and having a, a databases available for for smaller companies that might not be able to do all their own research is available. And all those types of measures, I think, um, we we talked about for the previous report and included some. Um, and we'll do that again now, because I think that for those companies who take their due diligence seriously, and many, of course, already are and are applying the OECD principles, but um, for those, there needs to be uh, support. And I think that for those that are cutting corners and for cowboy companies, what we need is a supervisor with teeth and a liability regime um, that is um, sufficiently dissuasive. Um, and of course, liability, maybe to, to add a few more words on that, liability will be one of the um, most content, uh, con, um, the, the most difficult topics for us in the European Parliament to find agreement on. Um, of course, liability is actually what CEOs would lie awake about at, at night. Um, and I think that the line between responsibility and liability is a very important one. Um, but if you draw that line, then of course, you need to make sure that it doesn't diminish um, responsibility. And I think that um, liability regimes and ensuring that there's civil liability, administrative liability, but that at the end of the day, this is a law that is dissuasive and that can, through its teeth, prevent the worst from happening. That's very, very important. Um, but those conversations you will have had in the German law as well, because those liability questions then lead you into where does liability stop? And what I couldn't accept is um, a law that says you are responsible as a company for your tier one suppliers. And that's then where your responsibility ends. I think best practice is that you have a duty at least to take a proactive interest in your entire supply chain. Um, and liability, I think, per the commission proposal needs to be um, a, a form of uh, failure of the due diligence um, uh, uh, on your behalf, uh, combined with with harm. Um, I'll leave it. I'll leave it there. I hope that answered some of the questions. Vielen, vielen Dank, Lara Wolters. Ich hoffe, es klappt mit der Übersetzung. Thank you so much, Lara Wolters. Is the interpretation working? Can you hear us? Yes, great. Thank you. So excellent timekeeping there. You were right on time, looking at the European level where we will continue to be interested what's going on. Unfortunately, we cannot go into detail here, but you touched upon them, established relationships and many other things like civil liability as well as reversing the burden of proof. There are many other things we would like to speak about at this conference here today involving different stakeholders. It's something that the virtual audience also touched upon, looking at the relevant, if it's relevant by, uh, if it's considered as something relevant by the business, 
And what about the other stakeholders, trade unions, other actors? Uh, if we don't assure that all actors are involved, then we, the law can probably not be successful. Unfortunately, I know that um, you will also have to leave um, and other things to do in Strasbourg. Lara Walters, thank you so much for being here with us. We will do our best to support everything that's going on in Brussels. But first of all, thank you so much for tuning in online. Thank you one more time. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Thank you. So this is a swift switch over, swift transition. Now let's focus on the next topic. It's rather different, but I think we heard a political perspective in the morning. And allow me to add to what Hubertus Heil said. He said it's not about making companies suffer. Let us rather look at what this can mean and do for businesses, looking at opportunities, focusing on chances, on opportunities, thanks to the due diligence laws. I hope uh, you'll, you won't misunderstand if I say we have long-standing experts here. Gerald Beister did communication studies and worked in the beginning for the RRAG company, then switched over to Avionic. Here he worked for many years as corporate responsibility manager. And this is where he initiated the corporate responsibility he, uh, actions of the company. And on the other hand, he has for many years dealt with these topics, environmental and human rights. So he was asked to join the compliance department of Avonik this year, and he became the very first human rights commissioner on 1st of July. A very warm welcome to you. Allow me to ask you to join me here on stage. Then our next long-standing expert is Albert Kruft. He's been a member of our company. He was here two years ago also. I'm sure many of you will remember him. He used to work in a chemical laboratory and then later on became a member of the Works Council, thanks to further training. He worked in different areas. on different topics that have to do with what we're speaking about here today as well. So, member of the European Works Council and Global of Global Forum Solvay. So, your work life has been quite long, but you've always stayed with the company survey, is that correct? You're going to retire soonish, but you still work as a consultant, so it's really great to have you here. So we touched upon, so we said that you are Gerald, you're an expert on this field. Albert, the same goes for you. So what about you looking at this fr from a perspective of your business? You're not starting from scratch. So maybe you can speak a bit about due diligence in your company. What has changed or what will change due to the due diligence law? I really hope the microphone is working. To tell you my story, I've 
been working with human rights ever since the guiding principles were published by the UN or agreed on by the UN. At, this, at that time, I was still working for the sustainability department of my company, and I tried to do my best to promote the issue. I tried to draw up a risks map for the company, and first of all, we looked at our own subsidiaries across the world, and then we went further into detail and also included our suppliers. There was awareness training, I had conducted awareness trainings in, at my, uh, in my company, and also trainings on other topics, and a lot of people were on board and supported this. And already a couple of years ago, it was clear that um, Supply Chain Act would be happening. Now, a year ago, or two years ago, our head of the board said that we now have to start working on implementing the topic in our company and introduced the topic of Supply Chain Act. There was the sustainability department, or function as we now call it, or the compliance and legal department. So those were the different departments that were up for discussion. And after this negotiations, we decided to introduce this as responsibility of compliance. And so I switched over. And it wasn't an easy thing to do for me. That is because uh, there were many discussions before then uh, that and a lot of many <laughs> negotiations. And I was involved in these negotiations. And the lawyers didn't always agree with my opinion, if you'll allow me to say so. A lot of clients were also involved. and. They have their demands. Well, all in all, allow me to say the results were not always satisfactory for me. But today I know the work that lawyers do in the realms of compliance, and I have learned a lot. I know many more things now, and looking at human rights, and taking human rights and including rooting rights and compliance doesn't mean that sustainability falls behind. No, the decision rather meant that many things were brought together, capacities were linked. So I think all in all, it's a, a positive development, and I myself benefited personally looking at the topic, but also looking at the experts that are there, experts on compliance. And I think that is crucial, because looking at sustainability, we did not have that experience. So this is just uh, in terms of a brief introduction. Albert, what about your perspective. I think you can, you are here to represent a different approach, but I also know well that this is something that's very close to your heart. Hello. Yeah, um, Hi, everyone. I've been a member of the Works Council for many, many years. I built up the European Works Council as well and the Global Forum as well. My background is, is in chemistry. It's a Belgian business was founded by Ernest many years ago, many moons ago, and he was always a sustainable entrepreneur. It's in, in the business, in the company's DNA, and the company, uh, the family still holds many of the shares of the company. So what do I need to mention? We have, uh, we're one of the very few businesses in the industry who have 
a global framework agreements. Now, what do does chemistry and global frameworks have to do with each other? Well, if you want to uphold human rights, if you want to respect human rights, you have to, first of all, look at your situation. One twenty-two thousand employees in many, many different locations around the world. So first thing you have to do, you have to make sure whether rights are respected, right of assembly and others. So that is why so we agreed to this framework agreement with STO. The, this is the global association with more than 50 million members. It has to do with social structures, with rights with social dialogue in the respective countries, but also it touches on, it includes suppliers. There's a paragraph, there's an article in the framework agreement that stipulates that suppliers have to adhere to fulfill human rights. So as I said, what we did in the beginning was look looking at our own subsidiaries, but every few years there is a renewal of this agreement and that's what happened this year in March and we tried to look at, so we looked at the situation around the world and decided, wanted to see where do we need to make amends, what needs to be done and we, that was exactly the time when the German Supply Chain Act was about to be passed or was being developed. We included this act and also another one in the agreement. We also decided to draw up, to set up, to establish a working group together with the representatives in order to be able to monitor supply chains better. And that's something that's A shining example can be at the forefront when it comes to monitoring of supply chain. So what do we do? Well, we speak with the management of our suppliers, with the employees, and what, what, with, with this we want to make sure that um, our agreements are uphold. Is that enough to start with? Yes, absolutely. Now, looking at global framework agreements, I think it's something we already touched upon during the last conference. And yes, this can, of course, help when it comes to fulfilling supply uh, due diligence obligations and also goes for the talks you have with your suppliers. But what tells is striking is that Solvay, or the question is rather, does Solvay do more? What else does Solvay do in order to fulfill due diligence act? Can you hear me? Yes. So, due diligence and human rights. So, Solvay, allow me to mention a few examples. I think you have all heard of the COVID pandemic and its consequences. So, in India, there was no vaccine made available by the state. So what is it that so they did? Well, all employees and their families were vaccinated. That's something that the company did. So in India, we have small families and who produce guan. It's an element that's used in shampooing, um, luxury shampoos. And there, it's usually women who run the plantations. So what did Solvay do? Solvay made funds available, handed them out to, their fam to the women so that they could take care of their families. And I think this has to do with responsibility, but also with matters of the environment. That is because looking at chemistry, of course, we have to look at our CO2 print. We want to be CO2 neutral in 2040. Gerald, 
during my presentation for today's conference, I looked at your social media channels and I think I found a quote that comes from you. We all have the obligation to protect other people's dignity and human rights. And you are the very first human rights commissioner at Avionic. And I have to be honest, I think you're the only one I know. I haven't heard of any other commissioners. And appointing a human rights commissioner is a recommendation from due, due diligence law. Now, what it is? what is your responsibility exactly? So if I stuck to the legislation, then I think in its justification it is uh, described in a way that the human rights representative needs to look into the effective, uh, effectiveness of the uh, compliance system and monitor it. So that's the official task. But now it's uh, that I'm part of the project group and many of these things all these measures that, that we are tackling at the moment, uh, that, uh, uh, that I accompany them from a human rights perspective. Now, this started with uh, the compliance management people, the lawyers, and giving them an overview of what human rights are we, are talking, to, to, are we talking about. Also, importantly, to tell the colleagues clearly that it's not only about the risks for companies but also for human beings because there, there's a big difference uh, compared to, to the existing compliance management system where it's about bribery and money laundering and all these topics. It's just more uh, about the reputational risks or uh, legal risks for companies and here it's um, not vice versa but it's a focus on on the risks for human beings and uh, also risks for the company as well. This is very important. And what I would also like to mention at Ivonik uh, and Albert uh, also outlined this. Uh, uh, we have it, we've had many measures at Ivonik that are paying off now. Together for Sustainability uh, Initiative. Uh, it, I think it was represented here a few we years ago. I only mentioned the, the lawyers, but what is also important uh, in the project group is also purchasing. Without these colleagues, it, do, it would definitely not work because they have an insight into our supply chain so that we can actually see where do the risks lie. I mean, to some extent we know, but in the risk analysis, we actually discovered topics that we weren't aware of. And uh, also the compliance colleagues didn't know about this, and we were quite surprised. And it transpired how valuable it was so that uh, our colleagues from procurement had always looked into this topic before. So what was the great surprise? Which topics were surprising to you? Well, one example that is that uh, what about um, uh, third-party companies in abroad? Um, do, uh, are the wages fair? What are the regulations? Uh, um, when uh, these outsourced uh, companies get involved? And another t uh, topic, and I had known about this before, um, sand. Many didn't know that there's a lot of risks associated to it. And, uh, of course, we will d dig into this and other topics that are well known, especially when it comes to palm oil or coconut oil. Um, these were things that we were already aware of. But if you dig deeper, then, uh, you know, you do have some surprises that you come across. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that this is the case. Digging deeper is a very good key word. So it's said more and more uh, the direct suppliers, yeah, you can still have an impact on them, but uh, the most serious violations of human rights, they happen uh, in other places, so to speak. So how 
uh, do you remedy the situation or h how do you make sure that the bad situations uh, improve? Well, if you allow me to start, as I said, we have this working group that we initiated with Industrial, and it's quite a recent one, and two weeks ago I was on a mission in Brazil, also in the framework of this agreement. And beforehand, uh, we sat together with the procurement department and well, asked, okay, how do you make sure that there are no um, human rights violations? Uh, they said, okay, we work with uh, ECOVADIS, and uh, they uh, verify to what extent uh, all of this is complied with, and they also um, give expert opinions. And uh, we have uh, 30,000 suppliers worldwide, so it's quite difficult. Uh, and we asked, okay, how can we tackle this? And in our agreement, we enshrined, if we're going to a, a, to a country, then we also want to look into the supply chains, and uh, we agreed the following. Uh, that we look at the 10 largest suppliers in that respective um, country. So we got the Ecovadis report together with Industrial, and we looked at it. And uh, we will make this available to the local trade unions, this report, so that they can also look into the report and say, yes, uh, we agree or we see deviations here. And then, of course, you can analyze much better where the deviations are and what the background is. I think this is the main problem. If we're talking about supply chains, I mean, there are so-called risk analysis. Uh, you have this Excel sheet. I mean, wh where do I get all the information from? And most, most uh, human rights violations are discovered by trade unions. And... And that's why I think the trade unions play a very important role in the supply chains. Yes, I can only agree with you. I also agree that the, the trade unions have a very important role to play. And I would like to tell you what has been happening at Evonik, and going back to purchasing um, or procurement. Um, and Ecovadis, and Ecovadis is the service provider um, for others, but we also do our own risk analysis. So when we get suppliers on board, then of, of course they have to go, run through a qualification procedure. Uh, it's Excel-based, uh, so in writing they receive a lot of questions that they need to answer and then things are verified, what kind of policies do they have in place, what kind of management systems for the implementation of these policies. And when the companies are approved for pre-qualification, then we need to negotiate uh, the contracts. and. Uh, I could also see this in the course of the last few years that this has been intensifying, that uh, these contracts also include human rights issues, also in our terms and conditions that are um, revised at the moment. We will also integrate these issues, um, the principles also of the Global Compact. And uh, we will also be a little bit more rigid than that. And it's not that we are negotiating these uh, contracts uh, with these uh, sub suppliers, but also our cu customers negotiate with us. And I can see that uh, human rights are becoming more and more relevant to people, so we have to become more transparent than we are at the moment in order to fulfill the requirements of our customers. TFS. Uh, was mentioned on various occasions. Uh, uh, we also have uh, an audience that, that is international. Maybe you can just mention and uh, explain what this is about. Uh, Together for Sustainability is an initiative by the chemical industry from Germany. It was about uh, increasing sustainability in chemicals uh, supply chains, and there are certain principles that the uh, results of certain assessments and audits are shared. 
and now there's a TTTFS Academy where trainings are conducted with regards to human rights and labor rights. And I said in the beginning it was a German initiative, but it has now become international. So many companies, so the first Chinese companies are involved in Eastern Asia. It's not only limited to Europe. And I think this initiative was a pioneer. And as I said, we benefit from it. And also the members need to need to go through assessments on a, uh, on a regular basis. So you are representatives uh, of uh, bigger companies or larger companies, but you already said oh, you also, from your suppliers and customers, you also get certain requirements. And very often it is said, okay, the bigger companies hand down everything to the smaller companies. And uh, the SMEs are indirectly affected by the law and they can't really fulfill the requirements. So how do you deal with this uh, in the situation? Do you is there support or what or do you, do you see this problem at all that uh, SMEs might uh, be released from this uh, responsibility. No, I don't really see that, that this, as the SMEs uh, can't really live up to the standards. I know many representatives from SMEs who are part of initiatives, and um, I would like to remind you of ISO 26000. Very often uh, I fought with the associations because they kept on giving this argument and that these SMEs uh, were a little bit annoyed uh, that uh, uh, it was also uh, um, presented that way by the companies' associations. I think if there's an interest in the company, then they are able to comply with uh, certain things. Uh, I mean, uh, maybe not on the, the same scale as the bigger companies, and maybe also complementing. It's also a lot of work for us. It's not something that we do uh, that easily. So these are new topics for many colleagues. And uh, the way it is justified in the law, um, that it's uh, not much bureaucracy involved, this is not the case. Yeah, but uh, it's not a new requirements. If you um, think about uh, the fact that the UN guiding principles were adopted 11 years ago, so um, uh, you're quite good um, if you started looking into this list last year. Now, this is a buzzword also. Uh, uh, trainings are also a keyword, let's say. You mentioned this, the project team is one thing, but on the other hand, uh, such due diligence obligations or the understanding of uh, complying with human rights can only be implemented by all of us. So, so what? how do you involve your own staff, your suppliers? What kind of measures do you implement? Well, we're just at the beginning of this process, I might say. And first of all, we need to create a global network. And as representatives of the workforce, it's not that easy. Sometimes um, the law actually is limited to, to Europe. And if you're talking about supply chains, uh, we think, OK, hopefully the bad guys are not here in Europe but in other parts of the world. So that's why this network is very important. And these framework agreement, or this framework agreement that we closed led to a World uh, work, Works Council. And um, and this is the, the actually the, the basis for contacts uh, with colleagues from Brazil to India. And if you look at the cultural differences, and if I look at India, it's a completely different world. And if we're talking about the supply chains, then, as I said, uh, as uh, Michael said, we have to have a lot of stamina. Uh, um, uh, in India, 
uh, they don't even have internet and then of course you have to explain to you but now you need to take into account the supply chains so we're really at an, in an infancy stage and we can only do this together with the companies and also with the representatives of the workforce uh, in situ in order to raise awareness. Now, um, I could uh, um, endlessly discuss this topic. On the other hand, uh, we would like to also be a little bit interactive. Are there questions from the audience here in, um, in the hall to these two speakers? Then you would have the chance now. So there's a microphone over there, if you could just use that. Anke Drillus, coordinator of the, the Cora uh, Network uh, Company Responsibility, thank you very much for your presentations. And I would like to uh, go back to something that Franz de Korn mentioned, the question as uh, to uh, how, uh, how does a sewer in Ethiopia know that, that uh, he or she is um, uh, working for a German multinational company? Now, how do you create transparency along the supply chains for the general public, but also especially for those who are working in the supply chain? And what kind of complaint mechanisms uh, do you have? You know, that the problem at the moment, especially in situ uh, in, with regards to the direct employer, uh, the, the possibilities of actually um, enforcing one's own rights is quite difficult, and uh, that the European buyer needs to support. And this only works uh, if there's transparency and also complaint mecha mechanisms uh, that uh, you know affect the entire supply chain. H how do you go about that? Well, I can't really give you a f comprehensive answer, to be quite honest. Of course, we have a complaint mechanism that, that is uh, a third party or run by a third party, and everybody has access to it online. But this complaint mechanism, if you go into that, uh, it, uh, we have like 20 uh, languages uh, and diff uh, diff uh, different topics that are here, and also, amongst other things, human rights. At the moment, we are trying to find ways of how uh, we can make it even more accessible and that people make use of it more. It's not that easy because, of course, with the suppliers, you have to work with the suppliers. And uh, with Tier 1 um, suppliers, we do have access. But we also have to win them over to also make this public to other suppliers and that there is this complaint mechanism. Now, uh, we are negotiating at the moment um, to create uh, a hotline, a telephone hotline, but it's a difficult task uh, to make sure that up to tier N, all people actually know that they can make use of such a hotline. There might also be problems such as people not being able to read or write. Then um, you have to do this, uh, you know, orally. I mean, theoretically, all of this is clear. However, how you really address this, this will be subject to a longer process in order to actually involve all people. Yes, quite appropriately, from the chat, we also have a question. How do you um, protect your trade unions? Because there is a risk that, that they might lose their jobs uh, in, if they discover problems and make them public. Well, we work with Industrial Glo Global. They have their branch offices in different countries. And if the complaint mechanism or the complaint mechanism works in the following way. The local representatives of the tra trade unions um, uh, report this to um, uh, uh, Industrial Global. Um, uh, for example, in Solvay, Solvay in South Korea um, actually created a factory and 
and a, com or a company was commissioned to do so, and then Industrial Global um, sent us photos uh, from people who had been beaten, beaten up with um, bruises in their eyes, and we actually followed up on that, and we discovered that the um, um, company that, that was supposed to construct this uh, factory only um, um, uh, contracted people from a certain trade union, and and uh, this was communicated to, uh, to us, and then we influenced the, this uh, company and to try and um, remove uh, these wrongdoings. This is a way how it can work. Yes, one more question from the chat. So, how do you deal with existence uh, um, or f with w with the topic of wages uh, that are sufficient to survive. Well, yeah, uh, that's uh, one of the hot topics, of course. Um, um, we have a global social policy in our company, and this topic, uh, fair salaries, and not. Um, oh, I mean, this is how we d deal with it, and I know that in Germany and also abroad, we have uh, specific procedures for that. And uh, the Human Resources does this uh, as to how these uh, salaries and wages are established or defined. But I'm aware uh, we always have the minimum wage, which is the lowest level. And we also have uh, uh, additional um, benefits uh, such as insurance, etc. There are quite a few things available, but what the law requires with regards to actually um, making sure that people can actually live properly, um, we have that's not really com complied with. So we want to make some progress here to make sure that uh, we make yeah we make progress in this sense. Um, question to uh, I, Albert, uh, would it make sense internationally and also in other industries uh, to um, rely on global framework agreements and how can uh, the workers and the informal workers uh, be reached that haven't been reached by the trade union so far? So ch chem chemi the chemical industry um, uh, wasn't a good example. I think there are um, two global framework agreements. Uh, the, most of them are in the metal industry and the car industry because they were always very global. Uh, of course, I can only recommend everybody to do so. So if um, company management wants to implement what they um, uh, announce in their brochures, then they should have a global framework ag agreement and verify in situ to what extent uh, their policy actually reaches everybody. I can only recommend this to companies. And I have to say, we, uh, our CEO is backing this completely. She's a lady, the first lady uh, in the chemical industry who's been a CEO. Uh, she has Moroccan roots, uh, she's from Casablanca, and she knows what poverty means. She grew up under very difficult circumstances, and if you have such a CEO knowing what the world is like and what supply chains look like worldwide, then, you know, you do the right things. So the idea, the idea of the framework is uh, really good, and uh, I can also reveal um, I um, actually asked people in our company, and um, I didn't see any resistance uh, regarding this topic. And I can well imagine that uh, we would also close such a framework and adopt such a framework. Of course, we have to. Um, um, align this with our requirements, but uh, in principle, and not only myself, but many other th people think that this is an amazing thing. Okay, we will also keep bear that in mind and check this in the future. Another question from the chat. 
We have uh, some um, representatives of the workforce in the um, audience. So, what kind of uh, tasks will the works councils be confronted with with this new law? And what should they do first? And what kind of uh, first steps should they take? Do you have any recommendations? Well, I think uh, in the business committee. Uh, um, dealt with this topic and I was part of this uh, committee. I know what kind of uh, topics are dealt with there. And it's difficult to persuade the colleagues uh, saying, okay, you have to look worldwide and not only at your own location. You have to raise awareness amongst the works councils. But I hope that with the EU law that also the European works councils uh, will be playing an important role. And I think it's even more important there. Uh, and uh, to actually look in, into what is happening worldwide. Yeah, information is definitely one big issue. And I don't think that it only affects the southern hemisphere, but also Germany and Europe. On, and on the other hand, I think um, it can also uh, actually have an impact on the uh, locations. Yes, of course. Um, or our Works Council also is dealing with the topic. We don't have a European Works Council, but a Europe Forum, uh, which is a, a voluntary um, forum. But there's also a transformation working group. And I have close contact with this group. And I believe that uh, the works councils can also support in this work. I also saw this question, uh, what kind of questions or, um, or risks there might be for works councils. I mean, it's exactly their job and they are specifically protected in Germany. Yeah, in Germany. So. Just one or two more things. Uh, this morning we heard on various occasions that industrial or sectorial initiatives should be supported and if need be also at the European level uh, they should have a specific or special status. I know that the two of you are part of uh, different initiatives and are active in these initiatives and and uh, uh, involved also this standard of the chemical industry. What are your expectations of such uh, uh, in sectorial in initiatives and uh, what are the limits? Well, of course, uh, it's it's an excellent support, um, especially through Chemie Hoch 3, uh, which is one of the standards uh, with regards to the due diligence law. And I think this is a great support for companies, and especially those who haven't really been looking into this topic in the past so intensively. Uh, but also when it comes to a, a, industrial standard uh, is important to implement it. It, you know, it's no use to have the standard, but it's not implemented. So that's the decision, whether you do something or whether you say, okay, we do have such a policy, such a standard without implementing it. So this is something that I've been learning that what is important is what you do in the end. So uh, legal certainty, um, isn't uh, that important because I always think many things are being developed, are under development still, and you do still have a little bit of leeway. Okay, yes, I'm also part of this working uh, group as a workforce representative, very interesting um, um, uh, conclusion, as I said, standard and industry and every company has to see what do I take from the standard, what is adequate. Uh, uh, in chemical and uh, pharmaceutical industry, companies are so different and it's good framework also for the SMEs to see what do I have to take into account, where do the risks lie, but in the end we all have to do our homework. This is the most essential part. So, um, 
Yeah, and at the end of the day, it's the quality criteria uh, that play an important role. And to have uh, certification or filling them with life. And now coming to the end, we have one more minute left. Let's uh, talk about the introductory question. Uh, do you see the Supply Chain Due Diligence Act at the European or German level? Do you see it more uh, as an opportunity or a challenge? Well, I see it as an opportunity because it actually provides many possibilities. And what I can also see that especially younger people and graduates and also trainees uh, attach a great deal of importance to a company that is engaged, you know, in terms of uh, sustainability and human rights. This gives us many opportunities and I would say less risks. So, um, Okay, so it is a process that uh, will be developing in the course of the next few years and will be professionalizing. Yeah, I see it as a protection for those companies that are already doing a great deal. I'm just uh, reminding you of uh, Bangladesh and the cl collapsing of this building and what uh, actually was possible afterwards. Um, um, and this law will help uh, to separate uh, the bad ones from the good ones and to make uh, the world better. Uh, so you really have to um, point your, the finger, your finger at those who are doing wrong. Okay, I think this is worth an applause. So I would like to thank you. As I said, we uh, we could have talked about this for hours on end. I would have had so many questions also with regards to what is expected at the European level regarding this law that is to come. But what I concluded from you without uh, representatives of the workforce, without co-determination, without trade unions, it will be impossible um, and uh, we won't be able to achieve improvements in terms of human rights uh, situation and uh, the living conditions on the supply chains without these actors. Thank you very much. And my wonderful task is it to announce the break. Uh, we will have a short uh, lunch break until 12.30 and then we will see each other again for a very interesting panel where all these questions will be conjoined here in this room and uh, online. Have a great lunch break.
Very warm welcome back after the lunch break. I hope you'll survive the coma that usually sets in after lunch, and I hope you'll still be following this interesting discussion. So oh, we have the interesting panel discussion prepared for you, Global Resilience Through Human Rights. Are due diligence laws a game changer? So this is not a minor topic, this is a topic of utmost importance. So I'm delighted to have so many high-ranking panelists here for you this afternoon. Dr. Babel Koffler, Parliamentary State Secretary, Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development. She worked on the topic already before. Isabel Schumann, she speaks German really well. She's, she's the representative for the European Trade Union Confederation. And we can speak with her and talk about the role of trade unions when it comes to implementation, but also further development on an EU panel. Then who else is here? Well, Dr. Stefan Schwarzhöfler, Head of Sustainability of Continental AG. He has to implement the law, and I'm sure he can speak on the topic of this Game changer. And then we have Martin Knapp here on the panel, head of unit initiative for National International Sustainability Association of German Chambers of Industry and Commerce. And he is now the person who's responsible for sustainability. And he can speak on what this means in terms of putting this into practice for. SMEs. Let's have a look at the topic. Let's delve into it right away. Let's have a look at whether it is a game changer, and then uh, in the end, we'll try to come to a conclusion. But let's start first. So, first things first, let's have a look at this game changer. Is it a game changer? What's going on? What is planned? What does it mean? And the minister has said it this morning. It's the forgotten side of globalization that we have to speak about if we speak about resili resilience. That's the idea behind the law, and that's what Kofi Annan also was committed to when he started the group Human Rights and Labor Rights. It, and he said, well, that's what we need in the wake of liberalization, globalization after 1994, and how do we get human rights on board? Because I think it's about global resilience. The minister also said it in the morning, criticism on globalization comes up because it challenges our economic model, our open markets, uh, liberalization and others. Of course, there is a certain democracy fatigue that sets in if these issues are not tackled. So I think it is important to think about social aspects of globalization. Ms. Kofler, let's start with you. In your old role, you already touched upon the subject, um, but also, of course, in your new role. But most of all, I'm sure you can speak as a social democrat. Looking at the Supply Chain Act, maybe you can elaborate a bit. Now, let's give you my personal opinion. We celebrated the fact that we were able to pass this law in German Parliament. We popped the champagne, to be honest. It was an incredible moment for us, and we celebrated this moment. It's something that we want to eradicate, exploitation of human beings in its worst form. 
voyages that cannot even cover your expenses to make ends meet, exploitation of women, of children, forced labor, the list is endless. It's something that we want to eradicate here where we live. But what happened? Well, we outsourced it to other parts of the world, and I think all of us were responsible for that. And we need to achieve change. Minister Hai usually mentions the tannery in Ethiopia, and I saw it firsthand as well. I was there as well. Once you see how dangerous the workplace is, how risky it is to work, the chemicals running into the being led into the drinking water, just to name a few of the most perilous dangers. And then it's very clear that we have to do something and we, things need to change and all actors need to be involved, civil society, businesses, of course. And I, at the same time, I do think that laws are essential building blocks, provide the foundation. In Germany, we wanted to have a voluntary approach, we wanted to make it voluntary and we wanted to have due diligence according to the UN guidelines and a lot of people told us, well, we do this anyways or we do this already. So then I told them, why is it a problem then that we draw up a law because that will cover only what you already do. However, there were many procedures and processes, uh, academic procedure processes as well, and a large share of businesses have never touched on this topic before, due diligence along the supply chain. More than 60% have never looked into the matter. And that's why this was really a turning point saying goodbye to voluntary approach, looking at the French approach, taking the French approach as a role model. Now, if we think about bringing together all different laws and approaches in Europe, then I think it will be successful to get also good EU legislation, good and sound. Now, what are the main challenges for the EU process? Minister said it also already, there's this discussion. Um, there has been this discussion, shouldn't we have an EU law instead of a German law, but isn't that more relevant now? How much of a pioneer of a model project can the German law be? I do think it does play a main role because Germany is an economic powerhouse. And and tr tr major trading partner, and we're also not the first ones. It's a fairy tale, it's a fake news. French has a law, Netherlands, there is a law to eradicate child labor. We're not the only ones, but we are a main player and an important one. So if we didn't do it, if we didn't take this approach now, if we didn't have the law, that would influence the EU legislation. Yes, everyone who's been saying we need the EU law, we, we don't need a German law, and now it's the same people who say no, we don't need an EU law, we have the German law already, but I think we need both. We need national laws that can focus on individual state traditions, situations on the ground, but also an EU law that facilitates a level playing field for all. And that's where we want to go. That is our path ahead. And it needs to be mentioned that Germany, of course, is an economic powerhouse. And has major influence. Now, Ms. Schönemann, you're, Ms. Schönemann, you're a member of the European Trade Union Confederation, member of the board. So what about Germany as a showcase example, as a model project? Can it send out a strong signal? But also how important are these due diligence laws for employees? 
So first of all, thank you for inviting me here. If I understood you correctly, I think I can tell you we have our hands full at an OE level. We're pulling up our sleeves and we know that the laws that are there are insufficient. Especially now looking at the German Supply Chain Act, looking at works councils, I think there's still so much more that needs to be done to get to the same level on an uh, EU state. Looking at 2017, many things have happened, for example, 2017 in France, and many more things will follow suit, many more things will happen. France is also, uh, Belgium politics is also currently in the process of drawing up respective legislation. I think by mid-2024 we'll be able to make it and we'll have 27 national laws. There will be an EU regulation directive and this directive is supposed to be the standard. These standards, however, do not replace national standards or undermine them. What's already been agreed on a national level will stay in place, will stay put. But here again, on a German level, I think it is a great opportunity because we can introduce, uh, involve trade unions and work councils. This is something that is not yet introduced on, an, on the EU level, looking at state the le uh, legislation in the individual countries. I think there's still a lot we can learn from the German approach because so far it's not involved. Train unions and work councils are not involved and it's a problem. And I think this should be amended. And that is also why we fight for this. It's the reason for our motivation. It wasn't clear from the beginning, 2019, the EU Commission initiate commissioned a study, a study and we were interviewed as well. So trade unions are part of labor rights and that has to be emphasized. And those who did the impact assessment, they didn't understand at the time. We had to provide proof, consultation, EBR, European Works Councils. We needed to show that we are the ones, we are the main actors, we know what it's all about, we can provide relevant information, we know the risks involved, and with that I will conclude. So we are an important partner for this because the companies do not want to be responsible for risks, and that what they do, the businesses do, they outsource them. They are passed down along the supply chain in order not to be responsible. And risks, of course, involve costs. So, yes, human rights means costs and not invest, invest, and are no investments. Now, before we take a closer look at this perspective, how could trade union laws uh, rights be enforced in the German Supply Act. Allow me to ask first, looking at an, as looking at you as an act along in the supply chain, maybe you could further elaborate because perhaps the connection to business, if as soon as it's difficult on the ground, a lot of businesses say, well, we won't invest anymore in Congo. You're an international player when it comes to trade unions. Is it a game changer, the due diligence laws, or will it also, can it also be problematic? It will become, would turn to be a game changer if we can leave the voluntary approach behind. 
I think it has been said quite clearly by the German Parliament, but also as a result of the conference of on due diligence, there were some members of the OECD present. The OECD guidelines are important. It's true, but they are voluntary. So I think we have to be very clear on this. That it's the businesses. They decide who, which, what they want to do and what not to do, which responsibility to take on and which not. They are the sole de decide. They, they take the decisions on their own. And if we leave it at that, if we allow businesses to be the judges, to be the politicians, then this will not work. It's about introducing us as representatives of staff, of the employees. We need to be very clear on liability. And at this point, there's no obligation looking at the EU proposal at this at this point focuses on the code of conduct, on what businesses want to do and with whom and what not. A lot of businesses decide to cooperate with NGOs on topics of the environment. And there's an experts committee the commissioned by the EU commission, commission to report on the to draw up information on reporting and we are currently fighting we also want to include governance as well because at this point people are saying well social aspects that can wait what's important right now is the environment so they talk to the NGOs the businesses talk to the NGOs and not just Although businesses, as actors on the national stage, have to cooperate with employees. So you're already pointing the finger at the fact that sustainability involves several things, social and environmental topics. Unfortunately, the General Secretary of the Union of Kenya Metal Workers cannot be here today. It's a pity. She couldn't make it, but speaking to representatives from the Global South, what is their opinion? Do they think it's a game changer or do they have their concerns? Maybe you can speak a bit and tell us a bit more on the concerns of trade unions. We are very concerned, it is true. You mentioned the Global, but also only Global, and they inform they send us information and we can pass this information on. If we have access to the businesses, but that already is a very difficult thing to do. Looking at workers' rights, workers' rights, labor rights are human rights and they have been enshrined in international agreements. A lot of Actors want to say, well, this doesn't apply in my case. Um, so businesses who want to do, so companies who want to do business with certain countries and then don't want to take on responsibility. Um, of course, this is wrong because they opt for these countries be sim simply because human rights are not as protected as elsewhere. And you cannot tell me that there's no quality insurance for the product. If you buy a product from India or if you outsource produce production there or if you work with suppliers there, of course, when it's about the product, if it concerns the product, product, you take a very close look, try to see if the product is in a good condition when it comes to quality assurance, in terms of quality insurance. So why is that not? So if it works for the product, why can it not also work for the employees, for the staff on the ground? 
It's in order to save costs, but it doesn't convince me. I think it should be possible, and I think it is possible. We do not, a lot of companies say, well, we can't really monitor our suppliers because we don't know them that well. And it's not true. Of course, they know their suppliers. It has to do with um, monitoring and re putting in requirements for quality assurance when it comes to human rights. So we are able to protect the employees. And it's important to say that responsibility does not lie with us, but with those who produce the products on the ground, of course. But maybe one very last question to you during this last round. If there were to be a European due diligence act, would that make the work of an act of a few colleagues on the ground easier? Would it increase pressure that they have to serve all 27 EU countries. So what do you think? What is the discussion like in trade unions? Absolutely, I think it will be an incredible step ahead, a great progress for trade unions, for everyone, for employees, and also for companies who, try, who will do their best to implement the laws. I think it will mean great, immense, social progress, but it will also not be enough. At an EU level, we will still have to make sure to avoid products um, that involve forced labor, child labor, or exploitation, and we cannot allow them to enter the EU single market. It has to be very clear, if that's how you produce your product, then you cannot trade with EU countries and not enter the single market. Uh, we already have these regulations on timber trade, on conflict materials, and it's very clear. If human rights are not respected, then you cannot sell these products on the EU single market. And that is absolutely essential. We need to take these decisions and take these steps. But we also have to make sure that there is not a two-class system in for human rights. But And just to say this, put this into more provocative terms, why should children's rights be more important than tra un un trade union laws or, hum or workers' rights? I think we'll come back to that during the debate. This has to do with the due diligence laws, and this comes up time and again in our discussions, you banning certain products, different forms of regulation, whether it will lead to a classification of human rights, that is a risk that you have pointed to already early on. Let me now turn to Mr. Schwarzhöfler. He has to do with this, he deals with this game changer, and I'm sure you can speak a bit on this. You can tell us a bit on more. What does it mean in what does it mean in your business? What is the what does this law mean for you from a corporate perspective? It should be in the business's interest to have sustainable supply chains. So businesses, it's also relevant for businesses, isn't it? Well, first of all, allow me to say thank you to, for inviting me here. Allow me to cover the pers business's perspective. Of course, it's good to have a law. It makes a difference because I can tell my partners abroad there is a standard that I have to comply with, and it it's more relevant than simply saying that's what I want. So it's good to have this reference point that you can always come back to. And then, on the other hand, you have to make sure that this reference point, reference point can be implemented. And there, to be honest with you, there are weaknesses. There are things that won't work, that don't work in the 
German law and also flaws to the EU law. So what about competitive rights? Ms. Wolters mentioned it. She pointed to leverage. Competition and leverage don't really go together well. What about transparency obligations? That means I have to know the supply chain. And then looking at the simple examples for textile industry or mining, then maybe it might work. It might work there. But looking at car manufacturers, we buy products where we have 20 steps along the supply chain, and that's only one component of the car. So one product, so we have more than 100,000 direct suppliers, and if I multiply this, um, the database won't even be enough to cover all of that. So there is an incredible complexity involved. Speaking about as it being a game changer, I don't really like the di risk debate. It has to do more with impact, and we know impact is there. Looking at the very prominent example, polysilicium comes from China, and all of us, we know there are issues involved. However, it is a structural problem that no company can solve no business can solve on their own. So if it's a structural problem, what can solutions be like? We need to better establish our supply chains, but how can that be achieved? I want to be able to be, build a bridge as a business, and voluntar voluntary ones, but also to be able to meet all obligations. Um, me as a business, if it goes wrong, I have to cover, pay the fees, I might need to have to destroy my product. So there are many risks involved, and it ha this has to be included in the laws, because if it's not included, the ideas behind the law are good, but if they cannot be implemented, then that won't work to the best of our efforts. So there are certain problems that are so large that, that an individual company can't really do anything much about it. Jin Yang, China, was one of the examples that you mentioned. And uh, we'll took, uh, take a look into that in the, th uh, in the second round. Now, with regards to the risk in the UN guidelines, um, the, the Oh, and John Ruggie isn't naive, you know. Uh, he, he's, he says, okay, there's, there's, there's 100,000 that are rolling down on me, and uh, yet now I document 100,000 so, so suppliers. Uh, but, uh, and basically, uh, you wouldn't really um, get out of the situation yet. But uh, look at the uh, six central risks and address them. That's also the idea with the risk and also the risk idea in the laws. Don't uh, get lost in 80,000 suppliers, but go to the places where things are risky, where you really want to have the impact. Yes, um, uh, maybe we should also go dwell on what we just uh, discussed. Everybody has a different opinion here, and this is the, the r r d d d discussion on Ruggie and Ruffy's um, frame, uh, framework about the most salient. Is that as a list of a 10, of 100, or 200? So when is it most or close to most? So um, there's a lot of assessments uh, that need to be taken uh, in, into account, and I think the difference in this discussion is that, that these uh, limits are established in different ways. In the past, uh, we did a lot in, in terms of natural rubber, and uh, we, as a, an industry, we have a lot of responsibility uh, up to small farmers. Hundred thousands of uh, people are part of this uh, supply chain, so six million um, smallholders. Uh, just in terms of natural rubber. Just to trace that, and uh, we do that uh, with the GIZ, and in Indonesia with a regional approach, it, it takes years to create these projects uh, for implementation. You need pilot regions, you need structures, and it just takes time. Now, the question is, is that sufficient? We focused on one uh, example. It uh, It's uh, very costly, so is it okay if we just con con concentrate on that, or does it have to be per um, business area? So the regulation has a lot of um, 
or uh, this law has a, a lot of uh, flexibility and it's uh, supposed to uh, give support, uh, but there's no legal certainty. That means if liability is included, then of course I'm already in the situation that a court will clarify why the, or, or if the priority setting was correct or not. So in 10 years' time, we will not have a problem anymore. But until then, uh, I think uh, there will be a lot of collateral damage for those uh, companies where a verdict uh, was uh, given uh, with regards to this uh, flexibility. Now, that's what the companies are afraid of. Uh, and if, uh, you know, it goes up to co-determination and... And there's also a question of liability on behalf of management. Uh, if it's legislation, then you have to take it seriously. And if uh, f uh, flexibility is afterwards interpreted by the courts, then it is a threat for the company. And the, the reaction is to create legal certainty. And that's not what was wanted with this flexibility. So with these regulations, we really have to make, or we have to say, okay, you know, it's a good thing or an idea to focus on the most important ones, but it's difficult in practice. Now, uh, the implementation in Germany will be starting as from next year, and then there's also the federal office uh, that will monitor the situation. Of course, in the first round of reporting, um, there will be feedbacks and uh, uh, whether your risk analysis is sufficient or not. Do you not trust? Uh, so if you look at your company from your perspective, that you could say, okay, these are the five, six issues uh, that are hot topics, and, uh, and then you forward this to BAFA, and uh, that you would have a guarantee that uh, is sufficient to look into these five to six to topics. If you do a risk analysis, and um, our first round closes with these uh, seven or 11 risks, and then we'll take care of that, and that would you not trust that there was, this would be accepted? So I'm not uh, uh, concerned about BAFA and reporting. It's about uh, the broader context for example, uh, uh, li liability. But uh, I'm talking about a co completely different situation than in Germany, if we're looking at the European level. I mean, the, the reporting obligation um, is, isn't about whether the risks or not have been assessed properly or not. Now, uh, so this is not the issue. What I'm talking about is, is the aspect of liability as one thing and the dynamics that can uh, unfold from that. Because a company is uh, still uh, in public and uh, if you read uh, the newspapers, there are also some uh, compliance issues going through the press. So the discussion will then be a public one. So a company needs to prepare that the authority might say, okay, this is okay, but the, the general or public debate will be a different one. And we are also part of a longer supply chain. So we also have a customer uh, asking themselves, okay, is this okay what's happening here? But uh, I mean, we prioritize this, you that. So these are interdependencies that uh, mean that the, the reporting obligation is the, the smallest problem. You talk about the different loan liabilities. So maybe you can talk, talk about the details afterwards. And you also talked about the, the general public. So for the general public, it, it will be very important to uh, see that uh, the um, risk assessment um, corresponds to uh, the standards or that you say, okay, we've identified the most important risks. There might be another 15 risks because we have so many suppliers, but we have to start somewhere. Well, the question is, uh, now you did 15, but why didn't you do 20 or 25? Uh, why didn't you do 30? So, so um, you know, uh, where do you draw a line? So the... Uh, 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 law doesn't uh, give us this restriction and this is the uncertainty for companies so it's a legal thing um, uh, this is also something that you need to consider uh, as a compliance issue then you also have to look into the legal implications so if an advisory board uh, didn't uh, ask a, um, 
about the 21st topic, because there were 20 topics on the list, uh, w what happens then? So I think there's many things that might uh, be the implications. This needs to be taken into account. Um, you can't just uh, hand this over to others. And very often it is forgotten in body framework. Uh, it says that uh, the state is a very important actor. So what about these big monopolies? Are there institutions of the German state or the European Union that can come up to you and say, we have a problem that we can't solve on our own? Yeah, we'll go get back to that later on. Okay, so you are the head of uh, the Center for Sustainability. Uh, are you part of the compliance or the sust sustainability department? No, I'm the head of the, the sustainability department and I have a team that looks exactly into that topic. Okay, thank you. Last but not least, we have Mr. Knapp here. Um, I had already said you are not only responsible uh, for sustainability at the German Chambers of Industry and Commerce, uh, but you've already made experience also in China and in Greece in this framework about cha the German Chambers of Industry and Commerce. So maybe you can tell us from your perspective, we're talking about the game changer, will it help company uh, investing on the Balkans or on China to so say, okay, these are the new standards and we need to comply with that? Isn't that uh, an advantage to have such a law for the companies? Well, it varies. So uh, our uh, task is that uh, we are supposed to um, define and represent the, the over-interests of uh, the German uh, business sector. Well, it's a little bit difficult to say what the general interest is. We know uh, what is happening, roughly, but um, we uh, can't uh, ask for the experiences. We can't say X percent of the companies uh, are doing well with this law, and X per percent isn't for various reasons. So it's too early. So um, we actually received the documentation on the topic. But I wasn't really um, much wiser after having read that. So um, uh, it's uh, basically just uh, the general comments that you can find in online, etc. Apart from that, there was also this questionnaire uh, that was uh, um, expected with a lot of um, um, excitement with regards to the reporting and how it should occur, how it sh should be done. done. It's uh, 35 pages long. So um, it is a challenge to give all these answers, but these are the things that my predecessor um, or the, the other speaker said, um, this is something that is affecting the big companies. The big companies, i.e. those that are directly affected as from next year, with uh, more than 3,000 members of staff next year and then after 1,000 uh, members of staff, and then there's also quite a few um, indirectly affected uh, companies. So um, when the law was negotiated, we also focused uh, on these companies of, with 3,000, 1,000 members of staff, and we said, oh, okay, thank goodness the SMEs will be excluded, and this is how the legislators saw it at the time. But now we can see something different. We can see that uh, um, SMEs are coming up to the cham uh, German Chambers of Industry and Co Commerce, and um, we asked the Chambers of Com Com Commerce to um, forward the most interesting cases to, our, to us, to see what are the problems and what is actually happening to you guys. Now, uh, we actually... Uh, discovered that there are some small, very small companies that have big uh, customers and it's handed down to them. And in the big companies, there's maybe somebody who um, set uh, big priorities for the big company, but it uh, 
the big company would be stupid to hand it down to the smallest company because, uh, you know, the company doesn't really know what will happen uh, where. So uh, all the obligations will be fulfilled and then uh, um, a company with 10 members of start will staff will receive a catalogue of 10, 20 pages with regards to the obligations that need to be complied with and also uh, on behalf of their suppliers. So for such a small company, it is not feasible. Just a small example. I mean, we talk about the, the simple uh, supply chains. Uh, we don't really talk about the complex ones. Uh, everybody is uh, thinking of cocoa, cho um, coffee, and um, textiles. Okay, well, let's let's just stick to, to a very um, uh, simple chain: blueberry extract. So the blueberries come from Morocco or from Peru. And the extract is um, done in China. I don't know why. Um, I, I don't know why this blueberry tourism takes place in this way, but that's not the question. But uh, the, question, well, the fact is that it is produced in China. And so our importer would have to go up to the Chinese and say, uh, now you need to uh, make sure that the blueberries in Morocco and Peru, uh, that are, they are not picked uh, by children, which might uh, um, be something that occur, occurs. So it's a, um, it's a classical product of small holders, of small farmers. So the Chinese will probably say, I'm sorry, but I'm selling to you 3% of my production. So for, for, because of you, I won't change my business model and I will not uh, start uh, uh, getting on people's nerves in Morocco and Peru. This is just a small example. So if you look at this at, um, under a magnifying glass, then you will discover that uh, things become complicated. And then coming to the end, with regards to the story with the uh, blueberry extract, I mean, this uh, person has, uh, like, or this company has uh, 750 different products and just three members of staff. Okay, thank you very much for this example. I had another question with regards uh, to the opportunities in this game changer, and I uh, suppose uh, uh, your colleague or your colleague has said, "Okay, yes, this uh, law is uh, um, helping because uh, then I can tell the Chinese companies if you want to supply to the German or the European market, you need uh, to comply with these rules because it's clear that uh, these are standards that are relevant now. Before, if uh, you just had a national action plan, or oh, we don't have, want to have child labor any more, then the Chinese could say, well, you can have that and then just buy from somebody else. But now there's a standard uh, that even if it's not produced in China, but in, in Morocco itself, then these uh, rules need to be complied with. So, so isn't, isn't there a l rationale that m makes things e easier? Yes, I mean, if the Chinese manufacturer uh, wants to comply with this and uh, the market power is um, uh, sufficient. Otherwise, the Chinese can make reference to the anti-sanctions law, and it was actually adopted on the 8th uh, of June as well, such as the um, due diligence law, interestingly enough. And if you, uh, this is very blurry the way it is uh, worded, but if you um, interpreted it uh, correspondingly, then it could actually prohibit complying with the German legislation. Now, the question is how will the Chinese interpret this? From the official side, um, the Chinese told us we can't um, avoid uh, seeing this as an attack against China. Okay, I don't uh, want to make this a China debate, but your uh, colleague uh, from the Chamber of Commerce in um, Sh Shanghai said this. I mean, there are other supply chains uh, where there's not so many confrontations, uh, where the lever can be much pa more powerful. The question is, how can you use such a lever? And as Mr. Mr. Schwarzhofer said, uh, how is the, the lever different for different sized companies? Yeah, that's exactly what I was trying uh, to explain. 
uh, it can work out uh, uh, very well. We've heard good examples from the chemical industry and also bigger uh, companies and such as uh, Continental. I'm not really worried about them because there is manpower and the women power so to do all of this with all the problems in, involved. And maybe, maybe I will get uh, really uh, ugly <laughs> letters tomorrow from representatives of bigger companies. But if you are a small companies, if you have various bigger or larger companies, then the system will be handed down to them. So um, he or she cannot set priorities. No, they have to take over the priorities of the big companies. You can't avoid that. And that, that was also the big uh, surprise for us. We had not expected that uh, the, the smaller companies would be so much more effective than the bigger ones. So it, I can't, uh, yeah, it will be a game changer in quite a few cases, yes. Uh, we will have positive examples. And I would really love to, in three years' time, to uh, go to this tannery and see whether it's still looking the way it is looking at the moment. So, so it would be nice to see that the tannery isn't looking that way anymore. So it will depend on the individual case. So overall, um, the question uh, whether it is, will actually be the game changer, I, I, I can't really uh, respond to that. It, one more thing. Um, some um, laws are structured in a similar way. Uh, Wandel durch Handel, for example, um, so chain or uh, deforestation uh, and other things wanted to be tackled by um, these pieces of legislation. So there are quite a few things uh, that are or supposed to be working in the same way. Whether they actually work in the end, either you would have to be a prophet in order to see the, the future, into the, into the future. Yeah, we don't want to be prophets, of course, but uh, we could. L we know that the evaluation of this law will be very important. So, in three or five years' time, that uh, weak spots uh, are detected and discussed. Mrs. Koffler, you have the floor. You heard a lot. Now, the question regarding what Mr. Schwarzhöfler said with this openness: How many risks? Uh, do I have to focus on this nervousness that uh, we, we have here in the room? Could you react to that? Well, in this um, debate, something is expressed that, that uh, I see as a general problem. So there's a misunderstanding uh, what uh, the law is supposed to be doing or not doing. So uh, it is a process that we're talking about. And the uh, process means at the end of the day that uh, not as a uh, you um, alluded to, uh, if I, you know, is, the question is whether, whether I've been working on 20 or 21 risks. No, it's about making sure where do I have the risks I'm taking a responsibility for. You're not responsible for the dictatorship in China, but you take responsibility for products being produced in China, whether they were subject to uh, forced labor or not, and whether, uh, you know, you have to ask yourself whether you can produce it somewhere else. We're talking about diversification, especially when it comes to China or the question of dictatorships uh, uh, at a larger scale. I mean, you are quite right. I mean, uh, it's nothing that one company can resolve. Of course, there are also state uh, tasks and when it comes to you know diplomacy etc but also the responsibility uh, of states uh, to create legislation uh, favorable re legislation for certain things but i think uh, this is a misunderstanding a general um, misunderstanding mr knapp uh, I, I will be I'm very happy to go to the tannery with you in three years' time, but I would like to contradict you. I think this sounds very negative, um, i.e., uh, we uh, are describing what um, maybe will not be able to work with such a law, and not what are the tasks that we should look into. Now, I know, uh, I don't know about the pr details of the blueberry extract process, but you can ask your Itself, why does the extract have to be uh, manufactured in China? Why China? And why um, uh, do the blueberries have to be picked in Morocco by children? This is something that you should ask yourself. 
of, uh, and, and you know, try and see whether there are other possibilities for the company in order to remedy the situation. I think this is also the general problem with the liability that I wanted to address. Also, uh, we discussed this for the German law. It's not about uh, liability you're not liable for. Uh, you know, uh, misconduct by other uh, governments, etc. No, it's about gross net negligence cases. And I can remember examples that, that the security personnel was contracted that, that, that was um, uh, in order to, to beat up uh, trade unionists. And I think these are things that are deliberate and that she need to, you know, to be taken into account. So what is this about? At the end of the day, it's also the question of compliance. I think this is very interesting. You said one thing that was very interesting as, as, as the, as compliance and the impact on people. I think at the end of the day, it's about getting an effect, effect on people. And uh, this is something that I also want to achieve with liability rules that people have access to fair uh, um, pro proceedings. Uh, and I want to avoid that the wrongdoing actually p happens in the first place and uh, that also uh, the risk of uh, human rights and environmental uh, stands being violated, that this is minimized. I mean, we, we won't be able to resolve everything, but it's about the effect that uh, we can achieve at the end of the day. But also the um, representation of the brand in, in, the, in public, I mean, this is something um, that was already there um, before this law. I don't know whether why this is uh, connected to, with this law. So the, uh, the Rana Plaza uh, has its 10th anniversary next year, and uh, um, uh, the company um, associated with this uh, said uh, we can't uh, afford to have such an image loss again. And uh, uh, after Ch China cables, I talked to a car company. Uh, there was uh, so much ex uh, um, turmoil with regards to the, the image uh, before uh, the law. I mean, these are questions that the, the companies need to ask themselves, and also uh, uh, politicians need to um, ask themselves what they can do, creating a framework. So I think this fundamental misunderstanding that uh, this law is supposed to be regulating everything in detail, this is not the uh, purpose. It's about general dealing with very fundamental issues and not whether uh, everything is um, completely um, um, analyzed or, or scrutinized in detail. So especially when it comes to this SMEs, um, it was about the locksmith round the corner uh, who um, doesn't know where to get uh, the cables from. This was kind of the, the horror scenario uh, mentioned in the debate. When it comes to SMEs, we have to analyze where are they working and what are they working on. If we're talking um, uh, about the foundries, uh, they are small companies, but uh, also in the conflict minerals regulations, they are affected and they can live with that. I had many discussions also with the representatives uh, of uh, this industry, and they can live with the situation. So it's the question, who is affected how, and when it comes to SMEs, Many uh, 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 who are not part of the supply chain are already afraid uh, to receive like 40 pages questionnaires that they need to fill in. Also, involuntary cases, a lot of documentation obligations are uh, handed down to smaller companies. And this is, you know, compliance guidelines from different associations and I think a, a law can actually clarify when one uh, regulation that 
there is one, you know, set of rules and not many different requirements uh, or in the individual requirements by companies. I think uh, the, uh, the law can contribute to this clarification. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we talked about the game changer and what is possible in order um, to um, make this effective. Maybe in the second uh, round, should we look at the European government? Uh, the, uh, or the, the European level and what should be included or not. Mrs. Kofler, I will start with you. What would really be important uh, as a perspective or a prospect? We talked about a few things, uh, so the recognition of industrial standards, liability. Can you just summarize what would be fundamental for you? So you will probably be surprised um, what I think should be included. I never hit that I think um, liability questions uh, are important, uh, especially when it comes to gross uh, negligence and deliberate misconduct. I think uh, we need to uh, um, create access um, to uh, dispute social, and I think other um, environmental law aspects need to be included than in the German law. We just have four um, regulations here. And I would hope that in a European law, and I think I agree with Mrs. Schumann, uh, in integrating the co-determination rights on behalf of the workforce and uh, trade unions, that that is very important. That means also that we have an obligation in terms of education and I agree with you, uh, Mr. Schwarzhofer. Um, so we um, have a lot of responsibility when it comes to information, informing people, workforce and suppliers, and also in the um, partner com companies and pa countries. And I, um, yeah, I think, uh, uh, you know, some things need to be defined, uh, such as uh, an established business relationship, which is a very blurry term to me. I hope this will be deleted, but this kind of thing doesn't contribute to actually um, creating an impact on the ground. So these would be, well, this would be the basic question. I'm very happy that uh, we have a position on behalf of the government that, uh, that the European directive will be welcomed, uh, that we don't have the German vote, uh, that we don't say yes or no, but we actually welcome the uh, directive and it's not whether climate uh, targets need to be included, no, it's about, about um, how, uh, and of course there's a lot of discussions going on. I have um, already expressed my personal opinion on these things and we will work together with, the, with Parliament, with uh, the Commission and also with the partner countries and I'm pretty sure that we will receive a directive. Uh, and then, uh, which would create a level playing field. I really want to make sure that those companies that are really, uh, of course, not solving every problem, but that are really thinking about how standards can be complied with along the uh, supply chains, so that they don't suffer from worse conditions or that they have a, a competitive disadvantage compared to those uh, who are not caring about how things are produced. I think this has to play a role at the end of the day, and I think uh, the European Directive will help with that. <coughs> I know you have to leave a bit earlier, so let's quickly touch on the question of support for businesses in difficult situations. But now let's turn to the EU level first of all again. Ms. Schoenmann, you already said what would be important from a trade union's perspective, but you've been asked in the meantime on the perspectives of NGOs when it comes to the, what's in the law. So what would be crucial? 
according to the perspective of trade unions. Framework agreements could be a possibility for certain industries. Maybe just get started. Uh, please do elaborate. Yes, trade unions are such important players because they have the solutions for the problems. So that's why it's so important for us to be involved in that connections are established to the European Works Councils and also, of course, Uh, other aspects like collective bargaining uh, plays a role and needs to be enshrined in the law. Uh, we want to avoid that accidents take case, uh, um, that accidents happen. We want to have a preventive approach. We don't want the, to see the law to be broken, and that's why it's all the more important for the businesses to get on board. We have proof uh, there are businesses out there who are sustainable and they, all of them, have works council representatives and they have participation of their staffs and different forms of participation. That's what makes them sustainable and successful and that doesn't only work in Germany. No, it's a model that works also elsewhere and works well. Good and sustainable businesses should speed, speak out on the advantages and the COPA initiative where we cooperate closely with businesses the Kakao uh, group where we cooperate closely and that works well. And then there's also the access to legal cases. And I think there are employees who have been able to file suit and get access to legal proceedings. And that's why we're here. We're not something that's nice to have. That's not the role of trade unions. No. Uh, you touched on Rana Plaza already. What a scandal. I mean, those are business models that we want to stop. This is not what sustainability is about. Um, I don't want to have their definition of sustainability because that's not what it is in our understanding. But what was m the main problem here? I think the business used staff, no matter whether labor's rights were adhered to or not. And why? Well, just simply because it's cheaper. And that's something that we need to stop from happening. And for me, it's clear that we need to be involved, we need to be on board, and it's something that needs to be enshrined in the law as well. And we need a simplified access to legal proceedings. At this point, it's not possible. Article 47 of the EU Charter makes this very clear. So that would be a violation of this article. At this point, looking at the law, it doesn't make things easier. At this point, it plays into the hands of the businesses, and it's not the spirit we want to see or the spirit we expect looking at the law. Now, your question was whether we cooperate with NGOs, and yes, the answer is of course, and we have been for many years. Together with NGOs, we formulate our answers, and we were able to formulate several thousand answers to issues. And why is that? Well, of course, because we have, we share the same objectives, we work for the same things, and it is important for us to 
the counterweight for the interests of businesses, and they have a loud voice, especially in Brussels. And I'm sorry, if there are no sanctions, then there are no obligations. And I'm surprised to hear this time and again. CEOs who say, well, if we have to fulfill standards, comply with obligations, then we need to get rid of dual materiality as well. So not only looking at the impact on the impact on communities, on human beings, but also what about the impact, so this concerns dual impact, on the one hand on employees and environment, human loss, but then also looking at the impact on businesses. You cannot, in my opinion, however, you cannot trade worldwide, operate around the world, and then just pick and choose what laws you wish to abide by. I think as a business, you can only be an international trades company or an international company if you respect the environment. And not only that, I also think it's important to not only focus on profit on gains, and there's also a certain limit to profit if you are aware of the fact that children are suffering from your business or employees risking their lives for your profit. Mr. Schatzhöfler, the same question went out to you. What could be forms, what co forms of cooperation with civil societies could you imagine? What about what about mechanisms to co of complaint to complain? What about solutions? What could tools be? And then second question, what are your expectations towards the EU level, directed at the EU level? I think those two go hand in hand, actually, and I'd also like to in include the topic of a level playing field. I think that that's what the core idea, a level playing field for all. But that's not what we do. At this point, we regulate not only the international market, but also the EU market. Allow me to give you an example on wheels, on tires, now distributing production across the supply chain, then of course you could outsource outsourced due diligence obligations entirely and circumvent them. And for us this really is a disadvantage in competition because our competitors do just that. And with the, so it is basically thanks to this Law, to these laws that we don't get a level playing field and that we fall high behind in international competition. What about the EU directive? Well, there are two main risks involved. It's different for every individual country, uh, EU can, well, for every country, EU country. So 120, 150 companies, so continental at, at the quest of Example I mentioned, so we need to. So we have 27 different national laws, and they all share a core idea, but differ according to country. And this is a problem, and it's something that's discussed fiercely on the EU level. So, what about the laws? Do they have to be implemented across the whole? company or can there be different approaches? Now taking this to another level, um, trying to have more leverage, then of course it makes sense to get NGOs on board. Then you mentioned the sustainable rubber as an example, and yes, there are the, uh, regulations, obligations already out there. and. They, and that's what we need. And also circling back to the EU law, speaking about cooperation, collaboration, and com competitive law. 
zusammen. I can just repeat my, uh, myself and point back to what I already said. So our compliance department thought this was really hard to swallow and told us, well, don't do that. And human rights, of course, are okay, but we would still need a very clear regulation when it comes to human rights. And to get back to the blueberry extract, and let me give you another example when it comes to mechanisms of complaint and who will be liable along the supply chain. So the bakery around the corner, down the street, they produced a bun, and uh, Continental provides the machines of the machinery, uh, the machines of the bakery, and there's the raw material that comes in, but the machine has certain pieces. So there's the bakery. Maybe. Und dafür brauchen wir einfach Rules of Engagement. Das ist vollkommen okay, dass das gemacht wird. Für mich ist nur wichtig, wenn wir solche Themen aufgreifen. So this is just important here. If we include some examples, then we need to be sure that it can be implemented. So this highlights it. This is something that the report will highlight in the end if it doesn't work. But if things are clear, then everyone can follow suit. But there's a lot of uncertainty still involved, and that's what businesses are afraid of. And I, we, I think we also spoke about the mechanism in Mexico. What about legal implications? Will there be an, uh, something else I need to adhere on an EU level? And that's not what it should be about. Very clear to be very clear about responsibility, about liability, and have all the smaller players involved anyways, and our clients are on board anyways, they have their own systems, and everyone needs to interpret the law. Thank you so much. I think there were many things in your answer. I hope all of you, you wrote this down. So. You don't oppose a level playing field on an EU level, but it has to work, it has to be feasible in practice. And I think you pointed out possible flaws and also things that need to be improved in terms of competition. Now, Ms. Kofler. Kofler has to leave shortly, but so my last question to you. We spoke about safe harbor as well, framework conditions, and whether framework conditions could be safe harbors. What about standards? What are framework conditions? Could these work and could there be a safe harbor for certain industry, automotive industry? I'm not sure whether it can be a safe harbor. Textile alliance has been mentioned. So the floor goes to you. Not to mention the whole catalog, but it has to be more than what's out there already. So it can't be the lowest common denominator, the lowest standard. What we need is a standard that makes a difference for the people on the ground. So we can't just have a safe harbor to be able to say, OK, I've written it down here, so I don't have to take care of anything on the ground. This will undermine every, the main idea. And let me just emphasize this once again. We, what we want to achieve is that businesses look at these issues by their, and looking at their action, looking at their piece of the pie in the supply chain, chain and take pre preventive action looking at environmental problems, and it's something that can happen. It's something that can that we expect from our businesses here as well. And I think that's why it can also be expected from all actors along the supply chain. Now looking at the Textile Alliance, the green button is 
a model project here. And now we're currently working on Green Button 2.0. And the question is, what about the act or different actors? Can they be included, all actors along the supply chain? And yes, that's what the Green Button 2.0 will do. And I think, personally, this is an element that's absolutely crucial. I think this goes, so this goes for everywhere. This should apply everywhere around the world. If you work full time, you should be made, you should be able to make a living from it and not having to uh, go to the street to ask for money or donations. And we spoke about wages that cover your expenses, and there will be a handbook that will be published, and there are, of course, diverse perspectives on this, but looking at positive developments. Uh, so what are the factors that have a positive impetus for businesses as well? And I think we should focus on positive of the positive things, because I think what it's all about, it's about people who do their job and who deserve a fair wage, to deserve to stay healthy, um, not be at risk by doing their job. And then I think the overall situation will improve. And I think there are many studies out there that prove that, and that has to be included as well. So apologies, I have to leave. I would never do that during, and I wouldn't usually do that during a discussion. Very last question, has Mr. Schatzhöfler said it, funds to support the families. So there are needs out there, and I think it's something we should think about. And what about the political perspective? Could this be something that we can do? Well, looking at foreign policy and also national, situa national situation, I think this has to do. So there are places who don't know the situation in the countries so on an everyday basis. So it's about pointing out certain things. There are things that need to be further developed, and we need to communicate, and we need to make support available. And that also goes for the supplies on the ground. And that's what it's also. It's also about that. And it's also about the expectations, civil society. Trade unions on all along the whole supply chain, and we try to turn this to make an EU initiative out of this, coordinate this on an EU level, and really make sure that there can also be a support on an EU level that goes for businesses and trade levels and all players involved in the process. Well, thank you so much. Well, that will be the next step of implementation. There are many opportunities uh, still out there. I think this is just the beginning, so we're not even close to finishing. Well, thank you, Ms. Kofler. Maybe this is already your applause. We'll turn to all of you. Thank you so much and, say, and goodbye. Mr. Knapp, he already started moving, so I'll pass you the floor. Maybe just share your perspectives when it comes to an EU directive. Allow me to say, first of all, this EU directive, or this possible directive, already includes some specification according to industry. It reminds me of the detective looking for the criminal and puts, sends everyone to prison to make sure that the two perpetrators are imprisoned as well. So this way he can be sure. So we didn't want to draw black lists because we didn't want to get in trouble with the country's governments. We also didn't want white lists. And we didn't want to say, we, and we just wanted to speak about the first supplier outside of the EU. That could have been a possibility, but that's not what we wanted. And so, um, because we didn't want to make enemies, and we just thought, okay, let's make, let's let the businesses deal with it, and um, hence we had the voluntary approach. We wanted to 
have an industry-based approach because there are some industries who do not have the same issues, and I'm not sure whether this is still included in the draft. I'm sure many things have already we've already t uh, tackled during discussion, and then one thing was sure, okay, we have to support SMEs, and then we said yes, clients should support SMEs, but there, and also make financial uh, funds available. And then the question is, well, well how is this supposed to work, work? To work, will there be invoices to the client, or how is this supposed to work? And I think there are still things in the details of when we turn to the nitty gritty that need to be elaborated a bit further. Maybe one or two more things. Looking at liability, I think we already mentioned it has to fulfill a purpose. So it's still included in the German Supply Chain Act, but there's still the there's still a certain peril. We still have not managed to achieve the justice we were striving for. This also goes for the EU directive. The playing field level playing field is not there just yet. And we, what is said as well, we'll just go ahead, do something, but if you didn't do it correctly, then we will fine you. That's something that we saw in Iran as well. And that's something that will not stand before German Constitution, Court of Constitution, Constitutional Court. It will still take a few more years until we get there, but courts will correct this. And then, finally, you will, we will have legal security or the legal certainty we need. This also goes for the law. For the EU, so now speaking about the EU law, I, I think we need to say that we should not, we should make sure that it's along the lines of the German law as well. Thank you very much. Looking at the lists, I think the minister himself tried and did his best also to include the perspective of the food industries. There are many issues still here on European soil as well, so we cannot exclude it all together, and I think it's an important topic. But let's not start this discussion. I think human, a human right that cannot be implemented, cannot be brought before the court, is not a good right. Now, turning to the person to my right, our title is Resilient Through Human Rights. Let us have another look at the title. Mr. Schwarzhoeffler, does this help you in any way? Or how can this be helpful in discussion? There were no social rules and regulations. And now you have all the more obligations here, two emissions, fo footprint, environmental rights, so many more things need to be taken into account. And there are so many crises happening at this point. So wouldn't you say there's much more we need to achieve? Well, in my opinion, we need to, make, to differentiate between on the short term and on the long term. I think a lot of businesses are very aware of the fact that supply chains need to change it circular economy will become more important. A lot of problems will be solved this way. If we have a circular economy, supply chains will, will look completely different from what they look like now. Now, I think this is the long term or even the medium term perspective, but we also need to confront the reality. There was a pandemic, a pandemic that happened over the past two years, so our realities changed, supply chains fell apart or didn't work anymore. Let me just say that from my experience, the people affected by that, they so everyone involved in the supply chains, they can, they are 
they stumble, they cannot get back to their feet. Structures are no longer there because people who worked on this, they're simply not there anymore. They cannot get involved, cannot work in, anymore. So everything that was moved from Russia to the Asia Pacific region, that was the last shift, and now everyone involved, they, they, they have no more stamina. It simply cannot c continue along this path. So game change is not a button. It's the beginning of a journey. It has to do with communication, and we need to be very clear here. And there's a debate going on in, Bottle, uh, in Brussels. We speak about the first labor act that can be a switch. And if people are appalled when they hear about this, because they say, well, I'm not sure how this will work. If someone asks me, will you be doing what you do right now in five years' time? And I'm not sure whether I can do this personally, but also in business terms. Well, thank you so much for pointing out the burden one more time. Some crises can only be solved, or some issues can only be solved due to crises. And yes, exactly, that's why I mentioned short term and medium term. I think there's a difference, and it needs to be communicated very clearly. I think we need to focus on the long term perspective. So, Ms. Schumann, last remarks over to you. Sustainability discourse lacks social aspect. Maybe these could be good closing remarks, right? Yes, I think the message should be this. The directive has to be transposed into national law, and we need to make certain amendments. It's not a switch, and we're already working on this. What's the second part of my message? Well, investing in people, suppliers, people along the supply chain, they will have to put in an incredible amount of work to meet the prices that the partners demand, looking at investment, looking at wages, looking at good working conditions, looking at a social dialogue. That is a, there is a main difference. There are differences compared to a monologue, of course. So looking at the European Works Council, we work very hard to send out a mid-positive message, and it's based on what Lara Wolters already mentioned as well. Her report was a, a very good report. It provided the basis for the discussions and not what we saw from the EU Commission afterwards. It was welcomed, it was passed with a majority, with a broad majority, and that's why it's so important. So what we can see here, what's happening now is that the draft falls short in terms of standards. So we need to get back to the consensus, to what was already passed, what's the consensus that then the EU Parliament and it's on, what we currently work for to get back to this consensus to send out a positive message to the world, human rights work, human rights count. Thank you so much. I think that those were closing remarks. We've come to the end of our debate. There's no switch for due diligence. Maybe it can be a switch for framework conditions. Now we need to take a closer look at how this can be achieved in across the world, uh, but there are still 
issues in terms of implementation, and uh, we ask a lot from the businesses. They point out, businesses point out what's, what still needs to be done. Uh, it would be good to have a level playing field on an EU level, but at this point we have Potpourri. We've heard from many different stakeholders, we had many different perspectives represented here. A lot of this, a lot of you will, I'm sure, have found many things to take home. There is a broad consensus in the European Parliament, so it's important to take steps to make progress. And I think there are many opportunities. So I think that would be a brief summary. And with that, I would like to thank you, our panelists, Ms. Schumann, Mr. Knapp, Mr. Schwarzhöfler. So applause for our panelists. Noch ist es nicht vorbei. Unsere beiden Moderatorinnen kommen noch mal und verabschieden oder beenden. So our two hosts will be on stage to officially close our conference. Sind wir schon drauf? Sind wir? Are we online? Yeah. I can't really hear myself. Okay, so to get back to what I had already mentioned uh, with regards to Hubertus Heil, it's not about torturing companies, it's not about uh, torturing you uh, or the audience. Uh, we had five hours of intensive discussion, and I hope that it was not, not torture, uh, that it also has something, had something positive that you're taking home. I actually am drawing many conclusions, uh, maybe just a few buzzwords. Value chains uh, need to be thought in their robustness and their, their reliability, and also in, in the light of uh, these multiple crises that we're living at the moment. And also the question, how do you deal with dictatorships that are, uh, we are dealing with? There shouldn't be any false compromises, but it's not the, the sole com uh, companies or the sole responsibility of companies. We all need to make sure that things change. And what is very close to my heart, and I hadn't really heard a contradiction from anybody, is uh, that uh, trade Union co-determination uh, are very important, or is very important. Now, what I also found, found very interesting at the end, it's not the switch that is flipped. So you should not create this expectation. We are all working on changing processes, but it's processes we're talking about, and they need time. They need energy, and also many hands, many heads that join forces. And you always have to have that at the back of your mind when you evaluate and assess all these uh, things. Uh, what I liked was this thing. It's still a little, a little, little bit bumpy. So you will talk about the last aspects, Franziska, and uh, thank you very much yet again to your team and to the Friedrich Ebert Foundation. It was an amazing cooperation. And yeah, let's continue that way. I think we'll be uh, looking at this uh, topic in the future, and I think we will be cooperating. Yes, Carola, uh, thank you. Um, I don't think we should wait another two years with everything um, that will be happening yet next uh, uh, year, and um, with the law entering into force, and then the European level also creating a new law. I think we can see that uh, we are all very much involved 
in these topics, human rights and business, and for the protection of uh, human rights and the environment worldwide. And I think this is the central message that we wanted to transmit as a foundation. Of course, there's a lot more expertise and uh, uh, also uh, a lot of um, willingness to fight. Uh, we know that, we know that, that we're standing here uh, and that we're doing this event because we have so much expertise uh, together. So I would like to thank all speakers, uh, starting with uh, our Minister of uh, Labour and Social Affairs and the last, uh, up to the last speakers that we just heard. It was a lot of input and it gives us motivation to um, continue despite all conflicts and question marks that we have. And also, uh, thank you to everybody who was involved and uh, to the, the audience, the audience in the virtual space as well, and Carola, also thank you to you uh, for um, this very intensive and good co cooperation. And I would like to also thank um, the technicians. This is a hybrid event with all the different uh, things that this involves. involves. Um, thank you very much to the technical teams and also thanks uh, to the interpreters. And coming to an end, I would like to say we will continue. We won't talk about what we will be doing, but uh, with regards uh, to this conference, there will be a report. We will contact you. Uh, so the spoken word uh, will be recorded for further purposes and uh, this live stream uh, will be put out into the internet and that's good. So please uh, use or take uh, advantage of this uh, uh, opportunity to have another drink um, before you leave and see you again at Friedrich Ebert Stiftung.